When I said I would, when I said I would want to kill them all, what I meant was I wouldn't want to kill them all. Oh, oh it's such a misunderstanding. Oh, I know, but it's so easily mistake. rectified, and I'm sure we can all take that new information on board yes, now and carry yes. on like the original thing never happened. No, and please don't delegitimize my presidency. No, please. Speaking that's the, of, that's the worst thing you could. do. <laughs> Speaking uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, dil- delegitimate or illegitimate? Illegitimate. Illegitimate. Great start. Speaking of illegitimate starts, there was one, but speaking of illegitimate fiends. Fiends? Fines? France won Farages? the World Cup. That's a thing. Hey. France did win the World Cup. Yes. They did. Topical. Uh, of which we are many this week, many topics, because it's been a big news week for geek culture and pop nug shit and all that bollocks and I don't know anyway. Don't know. Welcome to the Big Damn Cast. I... Um, Chris, can you feel me? Can you feel me? Can you feel me? And put it on a dirty DVD, Johnson. I am Matthew. I can sell you several dirty DVDs, Watson. And I nearly choked on my drink at that. <laughs> um, wanky, wanky DVD. Now, for those of you listening at home, you're probably thinking, wanky, wanky DVD. Yeah. You're also probably thinking, um... Oh my god! I can't wait for these guys to crack open the egg that is San Diego Comic Con so far, so we can spill its newsy yolk all over our mouths and indeed chests. No pity. No, <laughs> because we are recording this on Wednesday, the eighteenth of July, just before SDCC kicks off next week. As always, is now a yearly tradition. It'll be our third one, actually. Will be our SDCC roundup next week's our episode. Third SDC roundup. Oh, SDCC. Ah. Uh... What's SDC? Um, San Diego. Can I don't know. <laughs> San Diego. San Diego <laughs> children. What? what SDC? San Diego. <laughs> the San Diego children. They are San here. Diego core. They're like the children of the corn. <laughs> San Diego corn. <laughs> Oh god. So what we're doing this week is covering up all the stuff that's spilled beforehand as well as giving our POV on a few bits and pieces of news. I don't have a POV. And also a big old review, which you can probably tell what it is from the thumbnail. Our American listeners are like, guys, you're a bit late on this. To our American listeners, I say, we only got the Incredibles this week. All right, give us a break. Listen. Just like we're only getting Ant-Man and the Wasp like in a couple more weeks' time. August 2nd. Yeah, oh god. It's so painful! Are we going to get the same week as Christopher Robin then? That's Disney shooting himself oh, in the yeah. foot, if so. Yeah, I don't imagine there'd be a lot of crossover, because I want to see Christopher Robin. Mm. And I'm not exactly a Pooh Mega fan, well, but I saw the trailer and just fell in love. You're not a Pooh Mega fan? No. I've seen those DVDs. Hey, hey, hey. But like, especially because they've now confirmed that Jim Cummings is also Tigger. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, as soon as I saw the trailer in front of Incredibles 2 mm. on Saturday, and I was like, yep, yeah, that is Jim Cummings. Which makes me wonder, what happened to Chris O'Dowd? Did he record and then it got changed? Or because because in Talking Tunes with Rob Paulson a few months ago, he spoke to Jim Cummings and he asked know, him about the Chris, film. Chris O'Dowd has been replaced by a body double. He was murdered by Walt Disney three years ago. This is is this conspiracy? Is this a bit? Is this a meme? <laughs> no. This is, is this meme? No. This is the absolute truth. Right. So was that Walt Disney's arm crawling around the spaceship? My distant cousin Paul Joseph Watson told me all about it. Wait a minute. In between trying to sell me brain supplements. Right, oh god. They turned the damn frogs gay. <laughs> um, Soy! Speaking of frogs, quickly before we move on with the New Year's, uh, last week the Muppets took... We already took, talked about France. Last week the Muppets took the O2... Racism! Racism! Um, I'm Chow Chang, y'all. Uh-oh. Racist system! Uh-oh. Um, so, last week the Muppets took the O2. Yes. And the reason why that's significant is because A, the Muppets, in the words of the great band Spray, everything's better with Muppets. But also, um, yes. two of the Doctors made an appearance uh, in a Pigs in Space sketch. Uh, on Pigs the... in <laughs> Space! So on the last night, uh, Peter Davison appeared as the fifth Doctor. On the first night, David Tennant appeared as the tenth Doctor. David Tennant, both in costume, both completely in character. Um, and there's a brief bit where Link Hogthrob gets dragged into the pl- a plot device in the console, <laughs> and all of his mon- molecules are being rearranged. Um, and on the back screen, we see him briefly transform into thirteen different other Muppets, each dressed to correspond with the Doctor. Brilliant, which is brilliant because the very last one is uh, a piggy duplicate, and. 
the audience on both the recordings of each performance I've seen immediately just lose their shit and go, yeah! And it's like, yay! Relevant jokes and so freaking relevant because it's the week before San Diego. This is great. Yes. Um, and also there's a wonderful bit where Scoot is trying to get David Tennant to leave the stage after the sketch and he doesn't leave and he's like, I, I'm enjoying myself. And he's like, David, you've got to go. And he goes, but I don't want to go. Oh! And Scoot says something like, yeah, you say that quite often, don't you? <laughs> Please leave. And this little German rabbit or whatever comes in and escorts him out oh. and, and makes a suggestion that it's going to try and molest him because family entertainment. Um, also David Tennant also David Tennant and Peter Davison which is weird it's a shame they didn't do it on the same night but the David Tennant night Kylie was the musical guest so at the end when all the guests are back on stage it was like hang on this is the weirdest voyage of the damn sea I know right I never thought I'd see so back from the dead that was oh, one fun. night only <laughs> wait hang on what? What? Um, no, she's not dead. Her molecules are scattered around the cosmos. No, she's dead. She's dead, but it was a poetic... Sort of, poetic death, yeah. Yeah, poetic death. Speaking of poetic deaths, what are the contents? Stuck. Stephen Moffat! Um, <laughs> uh, what are the contents this week? <laughs> the contents of this week. Uh, we're going to talk about some DC movie and TV news. we got our firm, some early glimpses at Aquaman and Shazam, uh, starring Sinbad, and... <laughs> We've also got an announcement of a new TV series starring a bat character. But whom? You'll find out soon. Uh, we've got some. We've got the first proper teaser for Doctor Who and also a couple of images. We had a lovely look at a fan film of all things. I'm not usually a fan of fan. I'm not usually a fan of fan films. I'm not a fan film fan. But this uh, particular <laughs> fan film, I was a fan of because it stars uh, television and films very own. Television and films. Very own Nathan Fillion uh, as uh, Nathan Drake. Um, it's an Uncharted fan film, and we'll talk about it a little bit. Also, we also have to shout at white dudes again because people are angry that they can't jerk off to the new Shira cartoon, and we'll get into that in a little bit before we launch into our giant review mm. of The Incredibles 2. But first, but first, DC. How will I fit? New. <laughs> Terribly. Um. <laughs> DC News, just squeeze it in. Oh, baby! Um, DC News. We've got our first poster. We've got two posters, in fact. We did, yeah. For Aquaman. Aquaman! It's happening. It's coming out. It's been made. The James Juan Aquaman. You can't stop Jason Momoa. Home is calling. People have tried. Home is calling. And you can't. (laughs) Oh, God. <laughs> he is unstoppable. We met Lucy and I met Jason Momoa at Comic Con in two thousand and eight. Uh, yeah. She was getting Stargate Atlantis stuff signed, and he had a giant cast on his leg. And uh, I wasn't. I'm not, I'm not like a big Stargate what, Atlantis like fan. I'm not the some, cast of Stargate Atlantis. Yeah, just clinging to it, yeah. just clinging ahoy. But I'm not like. We're a, I'm, riding I'm, this Game of Thrones train all the way to the end. But I'm not like. I'm not like a huge um, Stargate fan and stuff. So I, you know, I wasn't too fussed and stuff. Yeah, of course, she, it she went before Game of Thrones, wasn't it? This, about a year before, uh, two years before the first yeah, series yeah. I think yeah, and, and uh, she said but she was a bit nervous she was like will you come with me to get the autograph and I went yeah no, don't worry about it we'll well, it's a large one yes and we went and it was in Milton Keynes back when they used to do it in the stadium and uh, the cons were run less like a giant scam like they are now and more like a you know pleasant not too obvious scam but you, you can, can't say but that but when you get an autograph yeah I can uh, but when you get an autograph I was in the line for the, uh, the Michael J Fox photo thing in 2015 I know it's a giant scam I was there when Stan Lee had 500 uh, pre-ordered tickets and mine was one. It was a birthday present. Um, 250 uh, entrants to have a photo with him on Saturday. 250 to have an entrance with him on Sunday. And on both days they opened up another 500 tickets per day. So that that, that then 91-year-old man yeah. was bombarded for hours more than yeah. he contractually was meant to. Yeah, um, that sounds right. And he possibly... Went, yeah, okay, fair enough. But he probably didn't realise it was going to be an additional thousand people over the course of the weekend. He probably thought it'd be another couple hundred, maybe. So it's mental. Um, that's that's what we call exploitation. Yeah. Yeah. And it happens to a lot of people, these cons. But back in the day, uh, about ten years ago, they were a little more relaxed. So when you, for example, went to get an autograph off someone, you had a moment or two to chat with them. Like, there wasn't this whole, right, okay, can we keep it moving along, please? Like, just had a second. Even if it was just to be like, hi, how you doing? Like, and the actors, a lot of them, and the artists and stuff, delighted to have that because they'd just be really nice for a second. They'd be like, you know, how you doing? Oh, where have you come from? Oh my God, from that far? Oh, I really appreciate it. Thanks. Where oh, have you come from? Do you know what I mean? Just that little moment with them so you can walk away and go, oh my God, 
the, the reason you go to conventions, I met such a body. Yeah. Like, I met them, not... I yeah. briefly saw them as they signed some, and then I was told to leave. Like, that's it, the thing that's never know. really... That why I've never really been enticed by conventions and meeting people at conventions, is because it is very much that line thing of going, mm. yeah, get an autograph, off you go. Get an autograph, off you go. Get an autograph. And it's just... That's not... It doesn't really appeal to me. I'm not an autograph yeah. guy. The, the ones I remember are the moments where you actually get a chance to yeah, chill with them. Yeah. Like, um, a few years ago, we, we, there's, uh, we call ourselves the Nerd Herd. Uh, my friend Adam, a uh, friend of the show, Adam Carl Armstrong. Hello, Adam. And his, his, his dad, Neil, would be the one who would basically <laughs> rent out like a big people carrier or a minivan. Yeah. And a bunch of us would go down. And, and we'd, uh, it was when we were in Manchester, when I was in London, I'd, I'd meet down. him at the cons. And it was great because we, we would you know travel to these things and you'd have these wonderful moments. One of them was uh, Adam's younger brother's. Uh, Jake and Corrin met um, Bulk and Skull because they're huge Power Rangers fans ah. and Bulk and Skull were, were at um, I think it was London Film and Comic Con 2012 2013 and they were separate they'd been given a separate they were both next to each other in terms of the area but yeah. they'd been given separate fees so if you wanted to meet them both you had to pay twice <sighs> they found this out on the morning disagreed asked for some paper put a sign together Individual photos for the individual price. Combined photo was just like two pound more instead of like double the price. Yeah. They stuck that up in the middle. They scribbled out over the price sheets that have been put up and like graffitied it. And then they chatted with people. They took photos with people who came over. And you might say, you know, like, well, it was bulk and for Power Rangers. Like they're busy. No. They got really freaking busy. Uh, I don't know if you because remember Because it's Bulk this, and Skull. But Power Rangers was very, very popular. But the moment people saw that they were like defying it. They were like, oh my god, I want to meet them. Like, this is amazing. Yeah. And we, we, we chatted with them briefly. And the guy who plays Bulk is still acting in lots of things. The guy who plays Skull... Including Power Rangers. The guy, I know. The guy who plays Skull is a freaking drama teacher. Yeah. And doing very well at colleges in the United States. And occasionally they get together and drink and have a great time. And it's like, this is wonderful. But like, they saw Jake and Corrin. They saw these young kids. And they immediately... They, they spent 10 minutes chatting with them. Nice. Taking photos. There's a photo session booked later in the day. But they still took photos of the booth because they didn't give a shit. Yeah. Um, Lucy and I, the like most positive experience we ever had at one of those was with Jason Muse. It was amazing because it's Jason. Muse. It's Jason Muse, but he like I was the one time I cosplayed for a con. I went as the Eleventh Doctor in the, the green coat outfit, oh, nice. and we bought me all near. That was when we bought me all near that con. That's when oh, we bought yeah. the Captain America shield. Oh, so yeah. I've been wandering around for the best part of two hours, dressed as the Eleventh Doctor, holding a Captain America shield and me all near, which Jason Muse thought was the coolest fucking thing. I've got this Captain America shield now. We told him that this was actually our second time uh, this meeting him. fucking you. Because we'd met him at uh, the Jane Silent Bob Super Groovy Cartoon Movie screening in um, California in 2013. California! And he said, like, and he said, like, and you dudes, like, so you've travelled from Manchester to be here again. We went, yeah, yeah. And he said, like, that is, I mean, that is really sweet. I'm, thank you so much. And he came over and gave us a hug and then said, like, the things are really cool. Can we get a photo? So he got a photo, and we got a photo, and we have a photo of us and Jason Mewes hanging out with me and Mikos playing, him holding like our shield and Lucy holding me on it. And everyone has a photo. It's great. And on the autograph, he took the time to write, thanks for uh, another groovy session. And it's like... A groovy sesh. But do you know what I mean? Like, I'll remember that forever, because it's like, holy shit. Like, we met Jay from Jane Silent Bob, and we had a chat with him, and it was great. Yes. And the line was being held up, and you could see that the people in the line didn't care, because they were like, oh my god, that'll be me in a minute. Do you know what I mean? And, and it's that, that stuff. That stuff's great. So when we met Jason, and they don't have that. Now. I was wondering when you were going to get back to oh, Jason well, Momoa. It's well, been like we'll ten minutes. Like, so we met Jason Momoa in two thousand eight. Yes, and he had a massive cast on his leg, and Lucy plucked up the courage because she was shy as anything. Bless her, because he was uh, Ronan. Ronan. I have no Stargate idea. Atlantis. I have not watched Stargate Atlantis. She plucked up the courage to ask him about the cast, and he went, "Oh right," he says, "I've been here for a few days uh, in the UK. Um, I've never done a pub crawl before." Yeah, you don't you don't crawl from pub to pub, Jason. Uh, well, I, I said, like, what do you mean? And he went, we, yeah, I, uh, I we're talking like the sixth or seventh place. I collapsed outside and shattered a bone at my ankle. Good. And it was like, oh, God. And he Good. went, yeah. He says, but I'm definitely going to remember this one. So, <laughs> and he was, he was upbeat about it the whole time. Like, he, you know what I mean? He, he wasn't bothering him. He was like, this is freaking great. Because I mean, he just seemed like the sort of dude who'd be like, oh, you, I cut my finger off. That's fucking cool. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, just Jason, go with it. Jason Momoa is seems like a happy chappy yeah let's put it that way <laughs> kind of like you know full blown full blown relaxed party animal probably drunk all the time probably living off a life like saying throwing some axes saying, saying some slightly mischievous yep. comments about says some stupid, stupid shit. stuff yeah um, but you know you just imagine it'd be like uh, Jason we have some bad news <laughs> oh that's great one second
Go right ahead. <laughs> um, Are you getting drunk to forget? No, I'm just getting drunk. <laughs> Aquaman looks all right. It does. That poster especially. <laughs> the, the central one of him stood on the rock. Yeah. Surrounded by the sharks. Looks fucking I quite cool. like the, uh, the Star Wars style one. With all the heads. Yeah. And the Patrick yeah. the Patrick Wilson Ocean Master. Yes. Which I quite like. Oh god. Also Willem Dafoe. Yeah. Who well. was cut out of Justice League. Yeah, well he's back this. he's back, baby. And then greater numbers. Um, no, there's still only one of him. Alright. That's probably for the best. <laughs> How many Willem Dafoe's can you handle? We need to go back to formula. Um <laughs> Back to Formula Uh ow! Am I? That's what he said when he found out he wasn't in the clutch. Oh, 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 oh. oh, God. Back to script. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, DC Collectibles fucked up again this week. by What? Sending stuff to companies and then those companies put that stuff on their websites like idiots and then took them down. What? Including some statues based on Aquaman. So we have also now seen Black Manta in full. Oh, I haven't the seen statues. that. Actually. Yeah, it's it's everything you're imagining. Um, it's it's a pretty cool live action rendition Is of the Black Manta. Fairly outfit. comics accurate Black Manta. Yeah, a little more, little more diving suity. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so they've gone the believable route in one respect. Apart from at that the same ridiculous time, helmet. At the same time, it still has a big old wide... It's not as big as you'd want it to be. It's well, like a little smaller. But what it's is? Still... <laughs> oh, really? But it's still pretty cool. Um, yeah, I just think. Visually, the poster for Aquaman, posters, but like that that shark one, it almost has like a slightly cheeky edge to it. It's like, yeah, we're a bit fu- like Jason Momoa. We're fucking doing this, and and that that has made me like you know after all the DC movie output so far, aside from Wonder Woman, none of it gets me enthusiastic. This looks like but, it might have a sense of humor. Well, yeah, this poster's made me go. Okay, I'm interested. I w- I'm looking forward to the trailer. Yeah. Let's see if James Wan's voice can turn things around on this universe. Uh, let's also oh, see James Wan voicing Aquaman. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just gonna step in. <laughs> Jason Momoa is gonna walk up to like freaking uh, Ocean Master and open his mouth and go. Now you've probably noticed I'm uh, <laughs> I'm back here in Atlantis and I'm not happy about it. It's gonna be Taika Waititi. <laughs> You're coming into dub. Piss off, ghost. Piss off, ghost. <laughs> Have you seen that meme edit doing the rounds of Thanos and, and the, the, the the young Gamora saying, "Did you do it? Yes. What did it cost? Everything." And so we'll just edit in um, Corgan trying to kick her, and it says, "Piss off, ghost! Piss off, ghost!" <laughs> I think it's wonderful. Uh, so yeah, but speaking of DC playing around with tone, Entertainment Weekly have also whipped out ooh their Shazam images. Now this is the movie that no one thought existed, right? Yeah, the one where Sinbad played a genie. No, oh. I <laughs> no. was so excited. For starters, I was like, why did DC pick up that? For starters, the movie was Kazam with Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> Secondly, a genie from an enchanted boombox. A rapping genie from an enchanted boombox. Oh god! Mm. Now, also, mm. I mean, you know, Shaq, Shaq pulled it off. Whatever, but still, didn't pull off steel. Oh, but he pulled off Shaq Fu. Nah, you're more, you're more you're more snapping into a slim jim kind of guy. Aren't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so if I can if I can get if I can get away with it, if we're gonna have pop culture icons of the eighties and nineties developing their I own fighting style through ad campaigns. Snap into a slim jim. <laughs> Ooh yeah. As so, opposed to a chunky jim. Not into chunky jims. I like my jim slim. Um, a lovely jim. Nice man. I'm the chunky one. Uh, I'm a chunky monkey. Uh, but speaking of uh, <laughs> chunky fuck, monkeys, sorry. Zachary Levi looks huge in these promo images for Shazam. Huge. Like, it looks like it is that half and half thing of they've taken his stature, he's trimmed up as much as he can, and then the suit is doing the rest of the that work. That is a padded suit, for reals. Also, it's Shazam, so yeah, you can do that. Yeah, because Shazam is meant to be. fucking red. It's bright red with, red, a, with a glowing, glowing lightning, lightning bolt. bolt. Yes, you please. The Entertainment Weekly cover sums it up wonderfully. It's just him striking a slightly casual heroic pose. Like he's leaning back a bit with a big old freaking bubble of no, bubblegum in front his of his mouth. He's got his phone in the bottom yeah, of the frame. Yeah. I haven't seen the bottom of the, the picture. Of That's amazing. Yeah, he's Oh my god, yes, Entertainment Weekly, yes. well done. Yes. Um, yes. Setting the t- they've, they've been nailing it with covers the last two weeks, and they're, they're exclusives. Uh, the Shazam cover, wonderful. Uh, the little image of, I, it can't be Billy Batson, surely, but there's like a kid sort of like... This That's Billy Batson, yeah. Is it Billy? Okay, how's that happening? Magic. Alright. 
Um, so yeah, but, <laughs> those who don't know, Shazam is based on the DC comic book character uh, Captain Marvel. Originally, um, now called Shazam for legal reasons. What was he? What company was it originally? It wasn't Charles. Yeah, because was he was he was absorbed by DC. Wasn't yeah, he? because he was so similar to Superman. Yeah, and they were like, "Hey, you can't do that unless unless you do it with us." It was like, we're oh, just okay. gonna buy it. Thanks. So they, they 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 cease and desisted them out of business and then bought the character. Fair enough. I mean, that's that's what happened. You, that's how you can do a thing. Yeah. Um, but Shazam, for those who don't know, fourteen-year-old Billy Batson uh, is imbued with all the powers of a god when he shouts the word Shazam. Is the wizardry nonsense the... turns him into a like six foot four Superman statured like dashing superhero it's with the... a winning smile, a jet black sort of slick back hair, the wisdom of Solomon, the yeah. strength of Hercules, the speed of. Some fast bloke. Some bloke. Yeah. The something of Zeus, the something of Achilles, the something of... Mm, something. And some dude beginning with M. <laughs> Mercury. Speed of Mercury. Speed of Mercury. So basically, it's big, the superhero movie. I'm going to look it up. I need to know what it is now. That sums it up, really, doesn't it? Actually, it's, yeah, it's, it's big, big the superhero, superhero movie. movie. Um, He's a teenager in a giant... Pap- Superman's... Superman's body. Superman. Hello, I'm Billy Superman Superman. Batson. Um, if you want a really cool version of Shazam for a bit of shorthand, I would recommend um, watching Young Justice. There's a couple of episodes in season two where Shazam is Shazam. the one left in charge of like babysitting the group, like looking after them. And it's kind of wonderful because they think he's a lame adult trying to connect with them. But he's not. It's because he's got the mind of a 14-year-old and he's very much part of their thing. But can defend them if they come under attack because he's super powered. Um, it's pretty damn great. And the fact that they were making it surprised us when we first talked about it, because we were like, really? I thought they were going down the dark and gritty and weird neon bloodstained route thing. After Not BVS and Suicide today. Squad. But Shazam looks like it's all fun, and that's going to be great. And if, he it, has. if Aquaman is fun, and Shazam is fun, and Wonder Woman 1984 is you know still thrilling and, and, and has a sense of humour and warmth to it like the first one did, DC might be on track to set things right going forward as long as they stay away from making any more Superman or Batman or Suicide Squad stuff. Let's not do any of our recognisable characters because we kind of burnt those bridges. But th- isn't it weird that that's how yeah. they could possibly make things turn yeah, around? Yeah, yeah. If they do the Marvel thing, not in the copy and the formula, we don't want to copy the formula. No, not that. Do what Marvel did, which is take characters people didn't really care about in the mainstream and make people care about them. Blue and gold. Blue and gold. Blue and gold. Seriously? Blue and gold. You want a blue beetle and gold boost of gold movie? Was that was that not clear? Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, I mean, be, yeah, we are in a world where people now know who Rocket Raccoon is. Yeah, so, we can like, get away with blue beetle and boost of gold. We're at that point. Um, uh, but yeah. Shazam, by the way, is the wisdom of Solomon, mm-hmm. the strength of Hercules, Hercules, the stamina of Atlas, the strength of Hercules, power of Zeus. Yeah, but the strength of Hercules. The courage of Achilles. But the strength of Hercules. And the speed of Mercury. The strength of Hercules. So, yeah. There you go. But he's got the strength of Hercules. <laughs> Batwoman. Back to you! Alright, yeah. Um, the CW have announced, and I guess we're going to learn, learn more in the next few days after this recording, possibly at Comic Con, but uh, their new show, joining the Arrowverse of content, is Batwoman. Um, Kate Kane, Kate former Kane. soldier, yeah, Arab. Um, is and a, and a relative of Bruce Wayne. Mm-hmm. I think Kane is his is Martha Wayne's family. Yes, the Kanes um, becomes Batwoman, crime fighting Batwoman. Um, <laughs> Woman who fights crime. There's a there's like a bat. There's a bit of fuss around it because she's a lesbian, so that's cool. Also, yeah. she's Batwoman. That could be fun. That's all I have to say about that. It looks like the CW are never going to touch Batman, or at least touch Batman uh, in a place where we can show them on the doll. But um, if this is the way that we get a Batman show in the CW... By being Batwoman. By spotlighting a beloved character and giving her a first live-action iteration... Yeah. Go for it. Absolutely freaking go for it. Especially if this means uh, that they can do... um, Stuff like, you know, oh, we're going to have a Two-Face episode of Batwoman. I'm throwing my hat in the Because she, she has her own, like, rogues gallery, but it's not usually fleshed out. So you could start to hybridise it a bit. I'm throwing my hat in the ring for Karen Gillan as Batwoman. 
I don't think she would because it's a long engagement and she's started directing now. Fair enough. Though that would be cool. Actually, okay, ideal ideal Batwoman casting. very pale and she's a redhead. That's true. She tends to have cropped hair in a civilian identity and then wears a wig as part of the cowl. Yeah. Like a big old stream so of a long, a long red wig as part of the cowl. Hmm. Which I think is a really neat... I don't know why more heroes don't do that. That's a really hmm. neat idea. <laughs> I mean, I suppose if it covers your whole head, fair enough. But yeah, like that alone yeah. is enough to make people go like, well, Batwoman's got long red hair. It's like, <laughs> does she? Does she really? <laughs> you little shits. So that's the kind of look you're going for. Mm. I like it, though. I, I like the fact that this is happening. Um, it is happening. Apparently. But apparently a lot of the writers involved, as they've announced so far, are currently the main writing staff on Arrow, which is suggesting that perhaps Arrow is about to wrap up. That would be... nice? Yeah. I can't say I've ever got... I can't say I've ever got massively into Arrow. It just never really did it for me. Mm. The Flash was better, but again, I didn't stick with it. So, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. You know what they do need to start doing, I think, for these shows? And it'd be the same for the Marvel Netflix's like, uh, eventual sort of complete release on, on DVD and stuff as well. What's that? Release them as years. So, DC, CW, year one, you'd release... Arrow would be in that box set. Yeah, it would just be year Arrow. Year two would be Arrow. Year three would be Arrow and Flash. Year four would be Arrow, Flash, and if they get the rights, Supergirl. Year five would be Arrow, Flash, Supergirl, Legend of Tomorrow. Do you know what I mean? Like, because... In terms of following them, there is that many of them now that if people want to revisit it or start from the beginning, you've got to like bring up a Wikipedia also, article to know where everything is. I also think you don't need... Unless you're a completionist. I know these, I know a dude who has still not watched any of the Marvel Netflix shows because he wants to get through Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. first because he's convinced there's hidden secrets in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. about the MCU movies. No. No. <clears> no. I, no. I Agents, just Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is reactionary. Hey, I know. Had this conversation more than once. But there we go. Um, canon completionists, you know. Hello, I'm Canon. Canon completionist. Canon completionist. Canon Smallwood. Uh, <laughs> canon K- Smallwood completionist. Uh, canon Smallway. So yeah, I don't. I think you can just pick and choose. But I'm a person who can quite happily watch a series and not watch all the episodes in it. That doesn't bother me like it used to. You have more concerns in your life now. I do. Like shoes. shoes. Am I wearing my dancing shoes? Shoes. shoes. Someone bring shoes. me my shoes. Um, speaking of shoes, the doctor. The shoes are important. Also, uh, in yeah. another Entertainment Weekly cover, mm. with some preview pics. We got well. some. We got some more looks at uh, the new doctor and her companions. Ah, rebranded. They're no longer saying companions. Friends. They're referring to her as friends. Yeah. Friends. That's something I've noticed throughout all of the Mates. BBC stuff. Yeah. They're China saying, plate mate friends. Saying meet. Meet the Doctor's new friend, and so it's like, okay. Meet the Doctor's new plates. I think they're edging the word out. What? <laughs> sorry? Of, 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 of print. You know, <laughs> oh, sorry, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. After they've cleaned it. And, um, yeah, which is interesting. What's wrong with companions? I think it's just part of the overall reboot vibe, really, isn't it? It's like, we want to we want to make it feel a bit different, and we want to prove that it's, it's a family. It's not Doctor and Assistant, it's Doctor and her friends her family her family travelling so I kind of get it yeah I like so that I kind of get it um, I like that but yeah uh, so we also got during the World Cup finale the, the teaser the teaser and it is, it is really a tease because there's mm. not much there it's but more it's more tone set yeah it's tone set and uh, I mean okay it looks magical yeah I I wasn't blown away by it. Yeah, but it's a tease. But, it's but, not a... Ah, but... but Ah, no, but... Doctor Who does have a history of having but, some ah, really but. sort of cool teaser trailers, especially in the early years. The Fireball teaser. Fireball teaser? The, what, the, the series the one? The first Eccleston one, yeah. It's freaking amazing. Yeah, yeah. It gives you goosebumps, that one. Um, The series two one... I can't remember what the series two one was. I don't know. There was, a, there was definitely a, a specially filmed one. Oh, it was Rose. Rose, like, led that one, and the Doctor's just sort of in the back of frame. Um... The Martha and Doctor one from Series 3 is another one that stands out. Like, the two of them giving their what There was the two versions of the trailer, and then the image merges at the end and pulls out to reveal the two of them stood in front of the TARDIS. The Doctor and Donovan one was alright. The fifth Series 1 was brilliant. The, like, the falling through the yeah. vortex. Um, and they haven't really done any, any like that since then, apart from uh, the 
Capaldi one for series 10 where it's Nardole Bill and the Doctor walking through the the, the the corridors and all that stuff's exploding around them. But even that was just sort of like, a, again, just a tone setter. Yeah. And as is this one. However, I like the tone because it's cheeky. Um, it's a cheeky tone. It's a cheeky tone. It's a cheeky, cheeky It's a cheeky, cheeky tone. It's a cheeky, cheeky tone. What else? I like the fact that World Cup games were playing in the background. Yeah. Nice and hushed. That was cool. Good. It was like, yay, it could be happening right now. It is happening right now. So that was nice. Um, I love that big old grin at the end. Oh, yeah. I love that big old grin. It's, and the it's ear inspiring. Pi- I hadn't me. noticed the ear piercings before. Yeah, she's got them all, all up her left ear, I think. Yeah, it is. yeah that's yeah. quite cool. So, um, pretty sweet. Is that just Jodie Whittaker could not taking out her earrings? Or is that it a, could be a half, It could be thing, half and yeah. half. It's like Peter Capaldi didn't want to take off his wedding ring, so they made a case for it. Fair like the, the, so the ring he's wearing on his wedding finger is like a Gallifreyan thing, but it is literally it's over his wedding ring. Over his wedding ring. Ah, oh, cool. That's really good. Um, which is really cool. Because well, he was just, I guess he was just like, if we're going to be feel, I'm going to be taking it on and off all the time. I'm going to lose it. Yeah. I don't want to lose it. I would like to wear my wedding ring. Why, and they're why, like, why would you? well, fuck. Uh, oh, let's build a thing for it. The so doctor he, has he, rings. He only, so we only didn't wear it in deep breath, and then after that, he always wore it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he does have rings. He uses them to charm Zarbi from the room to room. Of <laughs> uh, <laughs> he uses them to to dupe Zarbi. You should have had a moment where he picks it up from underneath the console. and was like, "I've been looking for that since I was a clown," <laughs> and sticks it back on. Yeah, it fits now. Huzzah! No, back to the story. <laughs> and it just moves on. You're like, wait, what? There's a story. There's a story. Um, listen. Oh god! <laughs> so yeah, Doctor Who. I'm excited about it. What more can we say? We can't say any more until we see more. What is this feeling? What is this feeling? Can't fight this feeling anymore. I, well, don't then. I, I won't. Okay, I'm just going to enjoy it. I'm good. Um, Embrace. I also enjoyed the Uncharted fan film that came out this week, starring Nathan Fillion. Oh it's my days! Very good. Right, so it dropped in the middle of the week. A first-time director, I believe, or at least first-time director for this sort of thing. I'm going to have a look, and I will tell you in a moment. Started his social media accounts, Keep including talking. his YouTube. It's what you're good at. Just to debut this trailer. Um, yeah, uh, trailer. Fan film. Basically, uh, a couple of days ago, Nathan Fillion, on his Instagram, posted a photo of a compass and some old-looking maps and put, soon. And everyone went, the hell is this about? You cheeky bastard. Two days later, Uncharted, brackets, fan film, brackets, starring Nathan Fillion, arrived on YouTube. Yeah. This is important for several reasons. One, since 2008, Sony have had an Uncharted film in development. Yeah. It's been 10 years. We finally, earlier this year, got the news of what it was about and who'd been cast in it. It's set, it's set in the same continuity as the Uncharted games, at least currently. It is set early... Uh, in Nathan Drake's life, the the, tre- the life of treasure hunter uh, and historian Nathan Drake, uh, specifically set during the flashback period we saw in Uncharted Three, so he's you know in his late teens. Uh, Nathan Drake has been cast, and it is Tom Holland, who is a big Uncharted fan, and and had said at the time like I understand the pressure of playing this, but don't worry, I'm you know I'm going to go for it. I love these games and I love this character, and that was encouraging, but it brought up rumours and stories from the last sort of eight years yeah. of Uncharted being in development with Nathan Fillion in the lead. Yeah. And many times Nathan Fillion's been asked about it. Many times he's gone, yeah, no, it's not like, if, if anyone's talking about me, they've not talked to me yet. So, you know, but I'd love to. I love those games. I think they're great. That would be a lot of fun. Mm. And, you know, life goes on. Well, this director, have we got the name? Uh, is Alan Unger. He's not a first-time director. He's uh, directed... Oh. The Canadian action films Tapped Out and Gridlocked. Ah, good. So and he, Alan and he pitched he pitched it to, to Fillion over a Thai vegan dinner. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so Alan Ungar basically is a big fan of the games. And so is Fillion. And so is Fillion. And yeah. decided, hey, look, <laughs> you'd like to do that thing and they're not doing it. So should we do it for non-profit and just as a little experiment? And it took, I believe it was a few days to shoot. I think I read somewhere it was four or five days total. The shooting didn't take four or five days, but like in terms of the, the main bulk of produ- production and getting the yeah. getting the shots lined up and everything. Um, 
it's clearly a fan film in that you know it's uncharted, but it's obviously shot in like someone's house they're using yeah, or renting. Yeah, and uh, the, the, the the cast mostly donated time. Yeah, like, it's not. But it makes it sense in the film budget, because right. by the end of the movie, you realise they've basically made a live action version of the prologue level to one of the games. Yes, yeah. yeah. like it's it's that whole we're setting up for the adventure. It's a couple of cutscenes with an action sequence <laughs> in the middle. Like that's what yes, it is. yes, yes, it that's, goddamn that's what it is. is. Um, so. It's pretty great. It's 14 minutes long. It's Nathan Drake being captured by some blokes who are like, look, you're after our shit and we've caught you doing it and blah, 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 blah. But it becomes quite obvious that he and Sully have planned this because he wants to, from the inside, get some information. He finds more than he thought he was going to find and then gets the hell out of there, meets up with Sully. Elena makes an appearance. Yep, and they uh, set Messi off and Monroe is Elena and yep. Stephen Lang is Stephen Lang. Sully. So a like, good Sully. He's a damn good Sully. It works. Lucy absolutely, she loves these games. She introduced me yeah. to them. Sully's her favourite character. So when I told her about this, she was reluctant to watch it. I came home from work, she'd watched it, and she went, and Sully's pretty good as well. I was like, yay, even though you're saying it slightly reluctantly, that means that he didn't do terrible. Yay. And you're like the biggest critic of people playing that part because you love Sully. Yay. yay. The actual plays Sully in the games, I can't remember his name, but like, he basically is him. Yeah, yeah. He's very much an ink suit actor, yeah. So it's one of those where I was like, I'm surprised they didn't just go, just, 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 you, you just That's do just it. But, but Lang does a damn good job. He can, yeah. he can chew a cigar. He's not, he's not, he's not, he's not chunky like the, like, like game Victor is. Based on the cigar and the moustache, if they ever get to the point of feeling comfortable enough to cast J. Jonah Jameson in a Spider-Man movie again, Stephen Lang. can Stephen Lang play yeah, him, please? A buff ting Jameson? Buff ting Jameson. Buff ting Jameson. Um, I'd be fine with that. But... Victor goddamn Sullivan. <laughs> goddamn is. Um, this is great. Uh, I remember the last few years, whenever the story pops up again, people go, oh, Nathan Fillion would be great, but he's a bit too old now. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest, the moment the fan film started, I was like, this might be a bit weird to watch. Yeah. No, it's fine. Yeah. Like, at the start of it, you're like, oh, it's Nathan Fillion dressed as Drake. By minute two or three, you're like, no, I'm watching Drake. Or does like, Drake just I'm watching look Drake. like Nathan Fillion? Well, well non- neither of the three actors reprising roles of game characters, are playing roles of game characters, are trying to emulate the game character. Yeah, and they don't really look like them. But they're not intruding on no, the characterization. No, no. And the script is very uncharted. In terms of it's like that self-deprecating humor, I think and, it's and slightly everything. quippier than Drake is in the games. But I it think works. it has to be for a fifty-minute short yeah. though, just to be like, we're gonna have fun. Let's do it. Um, again, it feels like a, it feels like the prologue. The prologue to the games is usually there's this, that sense of humor and that sort of the snark is there. And, and like it, Drake is a smart ass, like yeah, he is. And just like Drake in the games, just just, just just like Drake, just like just like the character, he was obviously um, very influenced by in Indiana Jones, like. He gets beat to shit. Because oh, yeah. he's not a superhero. He's no. just a dude who well, happens to be pretty good with is, a gun. He, just, he does jump out of a second story window onto a concrete floor. Well, there is that. Yeah. And oh, survive. and that shot. That shot. <laughs> that, the exact replication of the FMV going yeah, into the gameplay. That was really good. Beautifully done. He runs like a dork, which is charming. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It really runs like a dog. The treasure stuff set up makes you go at the end. You're like, oh, that's kind of intriguing. Yeah. Oh, where's the rest of it? Oh, there isn't oh, anymore. There's gonna be a rest of it's it. a fan film. But of course, now petitions are starting. Well, they're at, people they, are saying Netflix. They maybe shot think it. about this. They shot it. Uh, they planned it and shot it to release this week just before SDCC because they're both going to be at SDCC and they're both going to be talking about it and spreading the word and getting more people to see it that's genius so this might be a Deadpool test footage situation or attempt to replicate it holy shit they may have like they could have finished this like in January and then then gone right we are now sitting on this they planned it in January and they shot it in May oh my god I mean I know it's a fan film it's a short but the turnaround on that it looks glorious for such a short turnaround that is amazing um, yeah, Nate Fillion has been public for a while about about being down to play Drake. Yeah, being D D to D T D down to and Drake. It, some people, some people say, "Oh, he's too old and schlubby for it now." But if you put it like in between three and four, it fit. No yeah, and if you watch that short film, yeah, it's great. Isn't it? It's like he's looking trim. Yeah, like you know what I mean. He, he just did it in between doing the pilot for his new series and it going to series. Mm-hmm. The rookie, it's some kind of cop drama, I think. Yeah, but give it to Netflix, man. Just. Netflix, one like eight episode series. Great. Why not? That'd be amazing. Why not? I would eat that shit up. I would cancel my Netflix subscription and then reinstall it just to watch that and get, show that I'd done it in time for that. Would you get to make a, point. a $20 a month Netflix Ultra subscription? 
to watch it. What the hell is that when it's at home? It's apparently something they're trialling where it's like unlimited screens and 4K Ultra HD because they're starting to gate off HD behind price tiers. What? Have you not seen this? This is for new members. Yeah, uh, Can it affect all, current members? I think it's for all members. For, if, for now, there is a ba- there is a tier below like the stand- what used to be the standard subscription which is not HD. Standard definition. Is this to try and separate the people who watch it on TV from the people who watch it on their phones, basically? I guess. Also, you, they've started gating off. They've started like m- putting a hard limit on the number of screens you can have per subscription and the number of people who can watch it simultaneously. The number of screens? Yeah, yeah as in like... Logins. How many, how many people can be what, streaming from the same account simultaneously? Oh, I thought, yeah, I thought it was, you could have up to four, can't you? I think it's, I think it's two. No, I'm sure it's on four. standard. No, because I I've got an account. Lucy's Lucy's got the account. Yeah, she's got uh, a profile. Yeah, I've got one, and her mum and dad have one. Okay. They should just call it the X clause because you the story for Netflix most days is that oh you know we broke up ages ago but we're sharing each other's Netflix accounts yeah still, yeah and uh, he hasn't kicked me off so I'm guessing it's fine it's, yeah it's, <laughs> it's just not, like it's uh, not completely my account uh, um, yeah. Uh, um, but Netflix asked the producing... Twitter essentially equivalent of I guess it's really over then when you realise that your Netflix account has been deleted Netflix are producing something new for the nerds what but not for all the nerds because some of them are getting quite upset about it I didn't know this was a Netflix exclusive uh, okay it's, it's Netflix and DreamWorks oh right well that's good because DreamWorks it's... have been churning out quality content on yep. Netflix some dis- dis- you know disputable stuff like Boss Baby series yep. about to come around and everything but stuff like Troll Hunters and the How to Drain Your Dragon series like that's amazing how can anyone be mad at the prospect of them doing a new fancy well, show this is uh, artist and writer Noel Stevenson is like spear is, is heading up this production of yeah. this revival of uh, She-Ra Princess of Power oh shit yeah. the show that started as a He-Man spin-off that became yeah. a legend in its own right um, That's awesome. Swords yes. and sorcery with a, a an aim to grab a female audience yes. and 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 be all about action and adventure it's and all very that good similar shit. to to, to He Man. Um, he Man is Teenage Princess camp and sweatiness yeah. and everything, but this is this is more uh, camp and glamorous. Teenage Princess, magic sword, magic words becomes a hero. Yeah, like awesome. a swashbuckling hero, um, and it looks. Like fun and cool and goofy and the character- I've, I've seen that main promo image. It looks really cool. The character designs look really neat. She just looks like a teenage girl who's geared up for combat. It looks great. Angry white dudes who can't get laid are very angry because they can't jerk off to it. Yeah. So right. for those wondering, uh, He Man and all that stuff back from that era is all. It's about muscles. Yeah. And- yeah. Rippling torso. And the 80s she looks like a supermodel. Yeah, yeah, like, you know, big lips. Backless the curves, dress. The backless dress. And that's fine. Swords and Sorcery does sort of have that, uh, you know, that archetype yeah, to it's, it. it's of... the Frank Frazetta thing. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and, and, that's, and that is fine. And there's no wrong with that. But here's the thing. It Times they time. are changing. It yeah. had its time and it had its place and it's gone now. Times they are changing. And to do that now would, would not be the right way to aim it at a young audience. It also, would be weird. Yeah. Like, if, let's if, you were, if you were looking to make a pulpy adult thing for adults and you wanted to harp on that era and, and either pay homage or take the piss, go for it. Great. But for a kid's cartoon, a little bit weird. Because guess what? This is a kid's cartoon. It's a kid's show. Yeah. It's not... It's not... It's not made for adults. The biggest influence on kids' shows in the last five years, uh, in terms of the look of new shows that are cropping up, is Steven Universe. Yeah. That's the biggest influence. And it, it's about cartoony designs, yeah. um, sort of rich, uh, what like, vibrant, but not, like, garish colour palettes. Mm-hmm. Um, features like, <coughs> like people's figures being exaggerated, yeah. and hairstyles are a big part of creating the silhouettes of characters. Yeah. And they've also been a lot more open to the body types of lots of different people which animation sort of has been based on obviously what the show is but superhero stuff has usually been very much like this is slim person this is be- beefy person yes this is busty lady this is older frail lady like you know it's, it's there's very much like a we have five templates for yeah. people and we're going to keep using them this modern stuff has been like steven universe and that i've experimented more yeah. like female characters have been different sizes they've been scrawnier they've been plumper there's been more emphasis on feminine features in a non-sexualized way yes males have finally it's... started to become a lot more 
of a set shape as opposed to an upside down triangle. And it's a non it's a non sexualized thing that's the important yeah. bit. Like it, it's, this... it's representing body types, but not going, hey, that's hot, right, guys? Yeah. Just going, hey, look, that looks like lots of different people that you this, know. This is a Shiro who looks like a young girl is shorts under the dress, flat yeah. boots. Yeah, like it's not no cleavage. It's like I think it's the full neck piece, in fact. Yeah, like, no, um, like no cleave. I think arms are no, out and stuff, like yeah. flexing the biceps and whatnot. But again, it's not like it's yeah. not sexualized. It's, That's it is, the, it's it is not a teenage girl, yeah. who is also a kick-ass warrior, looking like a teenage girl who's a kick-ass warrior. Yeah. Um, and and it's the down and dirtiness of the kick-ass warrior. They're not doing a thing of like, well, she wants to look like she wants to look cute and glam while she's doing it. It's like, no, she's beating the shit out of monsters. Like, yeah, she's gonna look like she's gonna See, beat right. the shit out of monsters. Like, the character is definitely pretty, but it's not a sexualized like beauty. It's just, oh, yeah. she's cute and she looks really cool. Yeah, but instead of that being the overriding story this week of, oh my god, look at this, it's a little freaking like kick-ass Xena warrior princess yeah. sort of show. She looks like a badass. This is great. The main reaction has been from very loud, quote unquote, fans of the original who are annoyed of the, uh, the D, the D beautification of the character and the world. I think the, um, one of the most egregious tweets I saw about it was, um, I'm paraphrasing this, but I don't particularly care because it's, uh, Really fucking stupid thing to say anyway. Uh, um, tomboyish lesbian makes she look like tomboyish lesbian. Disparaging uh, Noelle Stevenson as well as uh, she yeah. um, Not that we know anything about the new she uh, sexual orientation and not that it matters because, like I say, she's a teenage character. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> But again, if she were a tomboyish lesbian... That's fine. That's completely that's, fucking fine, that's guys. Fine. Because the important thing about this is that she was not... And the new one is not made for the sexual gratification of white men. And I say white men because it's always fucking white men. But that's the thing. It's people who... Because they're the only people, people who are entitled who, enough. It's, it's the people who would have been big He-Man fans when it first aired, who yeah. loved it. Probably when she first came out, were like, oh, this is stupid. It's girl He-Man. It's stupid. Then realised, actually, no, I kind of like it, but I won't talk about it. Yeah. And then have grown up going, oh, do you guys remember He-Man and She-Ra? Those shows were great. And then spent a I lot think of time... I had a bit of a crush on She-Ra when I was a kid. And then spent a lot of time on DeviantArt looking at pictures, <laughs> or drawing pictures, of He-Man and She-Ra fucking... Hey. Or maybe, like, She-Ra Hey, it's DeviantArt. There'd be, Beast like, Man. black blocks over it. And nope. A link to a fucking uncensored Tumblr or something. Nope. <laughs> DeviantArt don't censor shit anymore. Oh, God. Um... Who do you how I know that? Not to, yeah, no, wait, no, moving on. <laughs> no. Um, but do you know what I mean? It's, it's like, these are people who would be like, oh, I kind of had a crush on Shiro when I was a kid. As you do when you're a kid, you do find yourself having a crush on cartoon characters. It's how it happens. You just go like, oh, I kind of go, yeah. go a crush yeah. on that character from that show. And now they're annoyed that their crush is, as far as they're concerned in their personal tastes, uh, their crush has been spoiled and changed and isn't exactly what they fancy about that character. Yeah, because that Forgetting... original series doesn't exist anymore. Did you not know they destroyed every oh, copy? Oh, yeah, did they remove from the planet? Yeah, yeah. So they can't go back and watch that. No, oh, no, that's no, that's. So... Did you know gone. what? Maybe there is a problem. Then. Yeah, no. It's so stupid, isn't it? It's yeah. so stupid that people just assume that like their memory is. Te- oh, you've ruined Star Wars. No, no. No, if you if you no. if you like the older stuff, then it's still, still there, there and you can enjoy it so much. Yeah, but hey, do you, remember two, you... do you remember two years ago when you thought that Ghostbusters was ruined? Are you still watching the original Ghostbusters? Yeah. Oh, you've watched it several times since? Oh, yeah. What was your, what was your problem then? Oh, so I, I rewatched the new Ghostbusters over the weekend and it's it's not ruined anything. It's just... No. It's... It's a weird little thing. It's the textbook's definition of mediocre film. <laughs> like, it's fine. How was it rated on the Immortan Joe scale? Mediocre. Oh, surprise. He often rates things higher than no. Nope. No, he doesn't. He always everything rates things mediocre. Everything's mediocre. It's either mediocre or shiny and chrome. Um, <laughs> I give the new Robocop movie shiny and, and chrome. <laughs> I shall lead it to Valhalla. Uh, oh, I have witnessed this film. <laughs> and I rate it mediocre. Um, we witnessed the film this week. Yes, we got. We, that we bit. witnessed the Incredibles. Two. The the rushed out sequel to the recent <laughs> Pixar 
film. Oh shit! The Incredibles. You know the one that came out what sixteen years ago? Yeah, uh, two thousand four. It's a fourteen year old movie. Years, yeah. And that was the thing we spoke about <coughs> this movie when the trailers were out, and I remember our reaction was just sort of. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fine. It's, uh, like, in, in my in my mind, the time had passed for an incredible sequel. Like, uh, if you were gonna do it, you should have struck while the iron was hot. And it had for me, but I will say this: as soon as the short finished yesterday, and what a short! Film, which we'll get to that because that was good. What a short! Oh. Fucking heartbreaking. Oh. But, um, as soon as that short had finished, and the the uh, Disney uh, Walt Disney Pictures logo began of course in the tradition that they started a few years ago now where every single one of them is catered in some way to the movie itself which is nice I still think my favourite is the Jungle Book live action one where it just did the whole thing and then it just kept going backwards and went into the the, the river it was like oh that's really cool because yes. the music just kicked in it was like yes um, this one was pretty cool as soon as it began and that, those rumblings of the score started to tinkle away 13 year old me woke up and when is this happening? Am I about to watch an incredible sequel? And suddenly I was really excited. Uh, I'm happy to report that feeling did not go away for the preceding 145 minutes. Uh, 145. Uh, preceding the following uh, 105, 105 minutes. minutes. It did not go away. The preceding 105 minutes would have been. Oh, the following. Oh, yeah, that, that feeling. That feeling travelled back in time. Buying popcorn and. <laughs> oh no no no! We went cheap yesterday. Getting to the cinema. We, we had brekkie. We took our own water. <laughs> Exciting times. Um, but yeah, no, we we just went. The two of us, Lucy and I, sat down and went, "Yeah, no, okay, like we want to see this, but we'll see how it got." And we both left going, "That was freaking great. That it's, was really great." I enjoyed The Incredibles two quite a bit, way more than I was expecting to. Yeah, um, it was fun and smart and heartwarming in all the ways that the best Pixar movies are. Mm-hmm. It didn't make me cry like a child. It wasn't quite that heart wrenching. No, this one was uh, this one was definitely um, softer it, than the previous one. It was it was softer in that sense. It, de- it dealt with different emotions. Surprisingly, adult in parts. Yeah. yeah, dealt with different emotions. Not the kind of make you cry, but the kind of make you feel warm and fuzzy inside. Yeah. Um, the peril it, was real. The action was solid. I think this is. The writing was great. This is a film that is for all the people who were young watching the first one and are now having their own children and watching this one. Yes. Because it is it is even more a film about parenthood than the first one. But it'll also make you feel a bit younger because it's a time capsule in the sense that it carries on immediately yeah, after the last it, one. There's no time jump. It's, it kicks up immediately after the end of The Incredibles. So you will feel transported back yeah. to that moment. And because of the beauty of animation, you can do that. Oh, yeah. Like you can pick up the story immediately after the last one and no one looks any different except subtly because when I was editing the thumbnails for this together looking for source picks yeah I was looking at stills of the first and the second my god Pixar have improved they've gone back and redesigned everyone yeah but not in a way where you look at the old one and go oh that looks stupid like yeah because the world of each movie is completely consistent within itself well they've not they've not made major changes they've just Utilize the higher mm. polygon counts of the newer technology to yeah. enhance the the character models, and also made Elastigirl's hips bigger. Yes, you told because... me about that before, and I was like, "That I mean, yeah, she's I mean, she was always as as, as she as, was always pretty. She hippie. was she was always as it's now coined with two C's thick. Um, yeah, now even more so. And the film is not shy about indulging in that because well, there are a few shots of this movie where the camera lingers. For just a split second longer than usual. It's what um So you, the audience get a face full of Elastigirl's hips and butt. It's what T V <laughs> tropes call Hartman hips. Hartman hips. hips it's named after the production company that sort of um made it um uh, what's the word? Uh popularized the, yeah. the I'm gonna look it up now, but my my Bluetooth is just fucking destroyed itself and now I have to, I can't type because of course I can't um there we go I can do this <laughs> cancel no I don't want to disconnect what are you doing um yes let me look this up let me look this up but yeah it's, it's basically it was done because you can't if you want to make female characters look mature mm-hmm. and sort of sort of sexualized mm-hmm. but not in a creepy way yeah. then you don't do the bust you do the hips 
Right. And you, and you create that, so especially if you've got a small waist. Yeah. It's it's a way of, of I creating mean, that. The are also pretty heavy up top as well. Well, not well. Yeah. yeah. Um, how many hips? Um, there's, defi- there's definitely an element of, like, like, the people working on this have grown up with, you know, the male and female heroes in very tight outfits showing off their figure. Because even Mr. Incredible gets Dexter's a few. Mom. Even Mr. Incredible gets a few glory shots where you're just like they're celebrating how thick and freaking muscly he can look, but at the same time he's a big like tubby guy. Uh, the as D- well. the TV trope page uses Dexter's mom as the as the that is, example. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's so they wanted to make look wanted to look more mature than the average female in the series, but the cartoonists won't be giving the character big or even medium sized breasts. Often they can't because large breasts and an hourglass figure aren't considered to be family oriented, and their cartoon is in. The animation age ghetto, these are all TV show terms, mm. where big growth, where big breasts can't get past network standards and practices, or maybe it's a double at style it's decision. If you aren't using big breasts, how do you make a character look female? You narrow her waist and enlarge her hips. A lot. <laughs> and it's oh it's named after writer animator Butch Hartman, who's oh, named after Hartman, okay. Often make use of this trope because Steven Silver designs many of the characters for his shows. Um, yeah, so... like uh, Timmy's mom and Vicky and stuff, and fairly old parents, things like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. what have we got? Um... Yeah, Bruce, so Bruce Tim, yeah. Bruce Tim, fairly odd parents, Danny Phantom, uh, Bruce Tim does it all the time. Um... <laughs> Eden in Aladdin the series is an example here. <laughs> um, what else are we looking at? Uh, yeah, Danny Phantom. Yeah. DC Animated Universe has it with Livewire. Um, Batman right. Animated Series doesn't use the trope, but it does come into play with the, the new Batman Adventures. Yeah. Um, Dexter's Mommy, Dexter's Laboratory. The My Little Pony Equestria Girls. Uh, fairly Odd Parents. Whatever you do, don't tell those guys who are pissed off about the new Shira. No, no, don't do it. Um, They'll demand Hartman hips. No. Uh, yeah, but it's that kind of. It's that kind of thing. Charlotte Pickles in Rugrats. Oh, yeah. Um, um, Garnet in Steven Universe. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Big Damn Hips. Rebecca uh, Cunningham in Tailspin. In this week's episode, we're talking about Elastigirl's hips. Elastigirl's um, hips. Yeah, they, well, they, put it this way. They definitely they definitely sex up the idea of being a superhero a bit as part of the story device. In yeah. that it's like that glamorous world of what they used to be able to do and now they can't. And Elastigirl's getting to do it again, uh, and and Bob, uh, Mr. Incredible, isn't. And Megara, they do what? In Hercules. Oh yeah, Megara. Yeah, yeah. She she's, looks like yeah. a vase. She does. Freaking hell. Judy hops. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think we've lost Matt, guys. Mm. I think he's I'm just sorry, listing I've characters fallen, with wide I've hips. Falling down a Hartman hips hole. <laughs> This is what happens when I go on TV tropes. It's called all vagina, the right? The day. Um, so anyway, <laughs> oh god, there's a fight now. But yeah, um, so the story deals with uh, after the uh, events at the end of the last one, um, specifically with the Underminer, <laughs> reprised briefly once again by John Ratzenberger, who is, who is yeah undermined. undermined. Um, oh god. After that, after that event, Super's back in the spotlight for all the wrong reasons because of yeah. all the destruction caused, like with the Omnidroid and 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 then with the the Underminer. So, um, a giant corporate businessman called Winston Dever, played by Bob Odenkirk, who does a great job as a new uh, yeah. character in the thing. Um, and, and also, the character design is just Bob Odenkirk. Yes, which yeah. is right. they, they do that with his sister as well. It's just the actress. Yeah. Um, uh, his is... sister uh, Evelyn uh, um, they what are the uh, CEOs specifically the business savvy head and the uh, head of technology uh, of of um, of their father's com- their late father's company DevTech DevTech and their late father was a big believer in superheroes and supers as they're called in Incredibles uh, Catherine Keener is uh, Evelyn yeah um, who does a great job as well like she gets a lot to play with and she does it really yeah, well yeah 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 um, so they they're running this company and they decide that they you know after seeing uh, the Incredibles back in action uh, well Mr. Incredible and Last to Go back in action specifically during the thing with the Underminer they're like now's our chance here's how we're going to make this work yeah we change the spin like People see supers as people who leave a trail of destruction after trying to save the day. Well, what we do is we show you guys doing what you do best, and we remind the public as to why supers are awesome. So, 
They decide that out of the three that they've spoken to, Frozone, Mr. Incredible, and Elastigirl, the least likely to cause a giant amount of public damage. So The most marketable. most marketable is Elastigirl. So she's sent on the first assignment, which is turns out to involve a big new high-speed train and all this stuff. Um, meaning that for the future of superheroes, Helen, who's had to contend with the idea that maybe we need to go into hiding, <laughs> is suddenly kind of allowed to be herself again and is like, no, do you know what? This is good. And this is good for all of us. Because if I get this right, we can come out of hiding and we can finally like be superheroes And who doesn't again. want that? Which would be great. And Bob definitely wants that. But he also doesn't want to be Mr. Yeah. Incredible restrained to being look after the kids. Yeah, he's... He... Like, j- to just basically be house dad. And there's a big old thing of the identity crisis of Bob. Like, you know, he, he's always... He's been... Because they touch on it briefly. It's like, he's the one who... She's been uh, the housewife for the last, like, ten yeah. years. Yeah. And he's been the bread earner, the breadwinner. And now this is a chance to get it the other way around. Um... And he's sort of reluctant at that at first because he's, he's used to the habit of working, even though he hated his, like, his insurance job. He's used to the habit of working. So that he's like, no, I'll go out. But then this opportunity arises and he's like, yes, no, great, honey. You could like change things. This is awesome. I will support you. I'll stay at home. But this sucks because I want to be the one doing the assignments. <laughs> yes. And I hate this. And I thought that was going to get on my tits. I thought the storyline was going to be Bob is a little bit, you know, sort of sexist and arrogant and... and you know, feels like he's being sort of, you know, cuckolded and all this. And really, that's that's how he's feeling very briefly yeah. before he decides to book his fucking ideas up yeah. and be the best house dad ever. Like, he just goes, no, do you know what? I will do this. I will win at this so she can win at that so we can all win and everyone will be great. Yes. Um, unfortunately, a new supervillain is on the scene. The Screen Slaver. Which is a terrible and brilliant name at the same There's, time. There are, there are many terrible and yet brilliant names in this mm. film. It's, it, this film's stock in trade is names that are simultaneously terrible and brilliant, including one that you didn't understand until I mentioned yeah, it. Yeah, well, I, think, I, think, I, I don't think that the first and second name were said together in a scene, and I think that's why, I didn't, I think that's why I didn't they tweak. Were. Oh, well, then I feel you extra uh, bad. Yes. But um, who, what, was the, what was the name of the, the French mime from the first one? Um, bon Voyage. Bon Voyage. Oh, God. I mean, the names have been great. <laughs> Monsieur Incroyable. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> so good but um, but yes yeah, so a screen slaver shows up and basically it, it's, it's your typical mind control villain plot of like I'm going to show the world like my yeah. point of view and you know everyone's over reliance on technology means I can get into anyone's head and it's like oh god so it's, it's, it's your 60s Batman like yeah. mind control because this is still a peer- ostensibly a period set yeah like it, it's it's modern but it is very much the 50s there's style there's no cell phones there's no internet yeah it's 50s early 60s ish I mean, I mean, aesthetic it, there might be but it's never a thing because no. that's not how it works. Yeah. Phones are on cords. There's, mag- there's maglev trains and jets. Yeah, and it but... just looks great. The, the most high tech piece of equipment in the entire movie is the elastic bu- the elastic cycle. Yeah, that's the only thing that's like wow. That- and they talk about it being electric powered. Yeah, and everything's just like oh, that's kind of cool. That is a cool piece of tech, especially it's talky. especially when she can. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when she uh, freaking catapults herself across yeah. like gaps between buildings by it, it detaching in the middle, and she sort of like stretches her yeah. back end with the back end of the bike and then rams it into the front, and they like jump over buildings. It's very so smart. cool. It's it's a superhero vehicle that makes use of its superheroes rider riders abilities. Yes. When have we seen that? Like never. Pretty much, uh, we get. We never the, see that. The, 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 Why doesn't the, anyone else do the, that? The Incredible makes a return appearance the after the flashback from the first film. So good. Um, it is pretty damn great. Uh, but okay, like, but we'll go into spoiler territory because I do want to talk some. Spoilers. Yeah, we're going to spoil the shit out of Incredibles too. Not that it's not like it's not a huge spoilery film. No, like, no, no. We we can talk but, about but the plot. More the plot specific. happens. More it's still fun. Yeah, yeah. we we'll get into but, some specific spoilers. Well, let's do pros and cons before we go then uh, yeah um, pros and cons cons the ending's really abrupt it didn't leave me feeling like miffed but I was like oh is that it oh didn't bother okay me. yeah I'm fl- but now that I know that the ending's weirdly short I'll, I'll be fine with it on my re- return which I undoubtedly will return to watch it at some point um pros let's be honest the strongest element in the entire movie and um, I was so delighted after watching the movie to watch the Mark Commode review and find out we, I'm not alone in this thought. Jack-Jack. 
Jack Jack is so good. Everything with Jack Jack the baby. The fight with the raccoon is oh, incredible. Oh god, so Jack Jack's the, the the baby from the Incredibles. In the last movie we saw that the babysitter was being terrorized by some as yet unmentioned powers. Yeah. He briefly turns into a, a little monster in Syndrome's hands at the end of the first one, and Syndrome drops him and gets dragged into the plane. Demon baby. Demon baby. Uh this film confirms that the family didn't see that. Yeah. Because in this movie, they are terrified to learn that he can do stuff. And he can do, according to Edna Mode's readings, because of course she makes a fucking appearance. Of course she does. According to Edna Mode's readings, she, uh, Jack-Jack has at least 17 powers. Yes. Uh, that they know of. Which include laser eyes, lighting himself on fire. Dimensional strength, teleport. Dimensional yeah. teleporting, multiplication. Um, pyrokinesis. Demon baby pyrokinesis. Like, he's, he can do shit. And as he's a baby, every time he learns a new thing, he keeps trying to do it again. Uh, the vocal effects for Jack Jack are wonderful. It's the most joyous laughter you'll ever freaking hear in your yeah. life. The fight with the raccoon is amazing. The slapstick comedy that comes from his stuff. Because here's the thing. There's a lot of slapstick in this and a lot of moments that are quite funny that all veer on really dark tones. Yeah, there's some surprisingly adult stuff in this. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if you were unnerved by characters sort of like being mentally manipulated or suffocated or things like that, you're going to find some of this really hard to watch. Or toddlers fighting with wild animals. Yeah, like with the wild animal using its claws. Yeah. But it's a super strong baby, so don't worry. Like it's it's not a scratch, especially when it turns to when he turns to jelly. Yeah, like it just like smacks him and sticks to him, and it's like, uh? yeah, because <laughs> he's just sort of melting and laughing. Although my personal favorite Jack Jack power was the giant Jack Jack towards the end. Yeah, like because it comes giant, out of nowhere. It's like giant. He just grows obese and about seven foot tall. <laughs> <It's> so- <laughs> it's really good it's so good all Jack Jack stuff and then they follow his trail and the holes he leaves in the wall get smaller oh (laughs) it's such a the more I think about it the more I'm like yeah this is really cool and clever the returning cast are absolutely on form um the new cast are brilliant including the one replacement cast member I think it might have been two actually but the one definite one was Dash yeah different uh, actor different new voice actor because absolutely seamless yeah Absolutely seamless. Really seamless. It's almost like those casting folks at, uh, at Disney really know what they're doing. Huh? Mm. They do. Um, uh, Violet's story is frustratingly uh, relatable. Too real, man. Because it's like, too yeah, real. that shit happens. Um, she and Dash really get to prove themselves toward the end of the movie, having sort of been out of the action side of it for quite a chunk. Um, we get a couple of... Um, um, what do you want to call them? Proper journeyman voice actors popping up to get to get decent roles. So you got Paul Iding pops up as Reflux. So you got Phil Lamar pops up as Crush Hour. I thought uh, that was Phil Lamar. Phil Lamar. Yeah. You want me to uncrush something? <laughs> Can you unpunch some? <laughs> uh, like yeah. his power is just to crush. And of course, the aforementioned John Ratzenberger is Underminer. Underminer, freaking it's out. Very, very good. It's a really cool. I'm just ignoring really... pros and cons now here because I've, only, yeah. I've really only got good things to say about this movie. Really cool new heroes and stuff that you would meet, like Void and whatnot. Oh, um, I loved Void. Void was great. She was who plays Void? Um, Sophia Bush. Just she's so she's so endearing and, and like her nervousness and sort of neuro- yeah. neuroses is just so. And the way sort of Elastical sort of takes you under a wing mm-hmm. in a really subtle way is is really nice. And especially, like, even after they've wiped a mind control, they're like, oh, you were trying to kill us, like, two minutes ago, but come, I need your help to do this. Yeah. And I, only you can help me do this. Yeah. Um, it's a really positive movie, like, in that yeah. sense. I mean, again, like, positive when the tone is positive. There are some scenes where the tone is either uncomfortable or threatening, yeah. or in one case, flat-out horror film. And it works oh, um, really well. Oh, girl dying of hypoxia That's on the plane. That's disturbing. Yeah. That's that is that's terrible. Like, like, especially because the la- especially the last thing she says before she takes yeah. action, it's like, oh god, this is horrible. It's like, yeah, disturbing yeah, that's, stuff. That's great. It's um, really good. Screen Slavers Lair is like straight up horror film. Mm-hmm. Uh, send us a tweet if you see the movie after this and spot the hidden Mickey in that hidden scene. Mickey, because it ain't that hidden. Um, um, but you might be distracted by it slightly. Um, it was great. It was really, really fun. Um, Christopher. It definitely sits alongside like the Toy Story sequels rather than like 
Monsters University and Finding Dory. And stuff. Oh yeah, definitely. It's, definitely it's one of the stronger examples of stories they can tell with these characters. Christopher. Mastopher. Evelyn Dever. Yeah. Evelyn yeah. Dever. Should we go into spoilers? Evil Endeavor. Should we go into spoilers? We're already in spoilers. Let's do it, baby. Um, Evil Endeavor. Yeah, oh, I didn't tweet just, that Just get on. it. Yeah, just why Evil Endeavor. You... Um, <laughs> but I do like the mystery they set up is really nice with that. Yeah. And, and the fact that Screen Slaver wasn't even the villain. Screen no. Slaver was a character created by the villain to be the supervillain yeah. figurehead of it all. And has nothing to do with anything and has no idea what's going on. It's just a pizza delivery guy. And it's just like... Uh, and you find out the only reason she picked him was because the pizza was cold. And he was surly. He was surly. And he could put up a fight. Yeah. Like he, held, he held his own in a fight against Elastigirl briefly. The weapon he used in that was brilliant because it was just like a taser stick. Yeah. But it, the electricity like was red. And it worked brilliantly because basically every part of her that got zapped took a moment to sort of become yeah. solid again and then later which on which was genius it was like yeah, how do you how do you beat up Elastigirl aside from just like knocking her out it's well, like well you shock parts of her body so that she can't reform it properly just yet and then you and then, then she put her in the server room where it was sub-zero yeah and so she couldn't stretch yeah so it's like if she stretched further far enough she would break yeah, like could, a, well rubber loses its elasticity, its flexi- elasticity yeah. under at low temperatures it becomes brittle freaking hell just very smart very smart writing Oh god, it was just it was just good. Very it's, we get more Frozone this time, really. Love, like like in terms of Frozone. in action properly, yeah. it's really cool. Um you know, one thing I will commend it on weirdly, um, is even though it carries on directly from the first, and in the first ten minutes there are quite a few references to um how the world is as a result of the previous movie. Yeah. They move on from that really quickly. It just becomes its own adventure. It doesn't repeat which I, the which same I, beats. Yeah, and, and I'll say this, not one mention of the plot of the first one or anything. No. Which is interesting. Like, the majority of it you get is just like, oh, well, like we did this thing. Oh, they, no, they get... And then she mentions back on the island. And, and, and also like... when the, the jet crashes in the ha- on the house. When the jet crashes in the... Yeah, because like, oh, Bob's like, oh, I've got no suits. Why? Because they were all in the house when the jet crashed on it. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which yeah, I thought yeah. was quite neat, but yeah, this it's 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 very small incidental things. Yeah, not oh, do you remember that time we were on an island and Syndrome was fighting us, me and me. also we broke out and I like the Gazer Beam reference. Like Gazer Beam is mentioned in flashback. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and it, you don't get the whole oh, that's why Gazer Beam didn't pick up the phone because he was dead on an island. It's like no, it's did, they didn't need to do that because. Yeah. You remember it's a memorable part of the first movie, so you remember it, and it doesn't it's need to go. Disturbing part. Do of the you first remember movie? that Gazer a, Beam was a, one of the bodies in the cave in the first? It's a one? freaking disturbing part of the first movie. Yeah, these films get dark. Yeah, they do. Um, but again, he eats lightning great. and craps thunder. The word "crap" was used twice in a Pixar movie. It is PG. It's rated PG. It's true, but it was just, it was very weird. It disarmed me briefly. I was like, what, what the fuck? It really should have been rated 18 for the language that was being spewed by the fucking teenagers in my screening. Never. Hit me. Never Hit me. go and see a film in Manchester at the Great Northern at 3.30 on a Saturday afternoon. Especially if it's a PG. Because any cunt can get in. And what will happen is you'll have two massive groups of teenagers shouting things at the screen, mocking the serious parts of the film, shouting them saying there are children in the cinema to watch this children's film with their fucking families. And they're shouting pussy at the screen when people are getting upset. Like, oh, the opening, the, they did nothing but mock the opening shot, which was a beautiful little piece of short cinema. It was gorgeous. And they did nothing but mock it. And then they thunder up and down the fucking stairs the whole way through. They come in, go out, come in, go out. Why? Why on earth would you pay the amount of money it costs to go and see a fucking film? To spend the whole thing pissing and arsing about? What's wrong with you? It's because so many teenagers don't understand. This is not all teenagers, hashtag guys. But so many teenagers don't understand the actual value of the money they're spending. Well, there was at least two dozen of the cunts in this particular screening. One big group beat sat behind us on the other back and one big group sat down the front. Literally, after the movie started, we're talking about after Bow had finished, after, yeah. the, after the short had finished and during the opening part of Incredibles 2, about a dozen fucking kids marched out from the back row down the stairs and onto the front row. 
<laughs> so it's just make that moment to yeah. move from the fucking back, the very back of the cinema to the very front of the cinema. It's attention seeking fucking behaviour. Mm. It's people who don't get enough attention in their own lives and they have to go and act out in public and spoil the people's fucking time because they can't handle it any other way. But I enjoy this movie though. <laughs> Let's talk about Bao, actually. Let's talk about Bao. The little that short. was so cute. Absolutely gorgeous. It Just was beautiful. So cute. Just beautiful. Because again, dark. Like, yeah. dark. Um, we're, we're in spoiler section, so fuck it. Um, it's it's wonderful. And, and again, like, another thing that the internet found reason to complain about, a lot of American viewers, when it came out a few weeks ago in the States, said, I don't get it. What's not to well, get? That, what's not to get? It's it's an emotional story about family. Yeah, but like, like what was it? The Chinese traditions. Because the family's Chinese. What, what are you... It's, impl- it's implied you are, that the... You are right there, guys. Do you have a problem with it being something that isn't the same ethnicity and cultural origin as yourself? It's implied that it's in Chinatown. It's implied that the girlfriend's Canadian. All right. Because the, the father's wearing a maple leaf sweater later on. Oh, that's cute. After they thought... And, it, and it's... it's uh, yeah, because it's Chinatown of a metropolitan city, isn't yeah, it? Is, yeah. is the thing, because it's like the park scenes and everything. But it's... Yeah. It, people were just like culturally going, I don't get it. It's like... What do you mean? It's, it's clear as fucking day. It's a it's, 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 it's a it's a word cultural thing. It's, it's a wordless short that has chosen to set itself in this part of town yeah. with this family and their recipe and their traditions. But it's a short about like parents and their relationship with their yeah. kids. Like it's got nothing it's got, to do. It's got with universal them. themes. It's not a cultural thing. So it has stupid. universal themes on parental abandonment, yeah. on letting your children grow up and leave the nest. Because that's the thing. On that, maintaining a relationship with your children once you once they become adults. Because think for, again, for those who are not going to see it and don't mind spoilers, the plot basically is the um, uh, uh, husband and wife, and the wife's making dumplings in the morning, yeah. and she goes to eat her last dumpling, and it cries when she bites it. And it's got a little face, and then it sprouts arms and legs and a little body. And it's a baby. It's a baby with a dumpling for her head. Baby dumpling. And then she raises it. And it goes through, like, presumably, you know, decades, a couple decades of it raising of her raising this tiny yeah. thing. And She doesn't like it playing with the other other children because he'll get hurt, but... Yeah, because he, cause, cause to... he, he gets squished, like, yeah. just to refill him with, like, stuffing, dumpling stuff in. And, and he clearly gets, um... He starts to, like, they're, they're, they love to get each more other, but he starts to get more independent yeah. and feel like he's being restricted from things. Yeah. And eventually like he hangs out with his friends and he doesn't spend time with his mom and then and and it is suspiciously like she's wearing pretty much like the same thing yeah, all yeah. It, and you never see the 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 husband at any point during the rest of the film for a while yeah and that's when i was like i don't think this is real it's a metaphor yeah because again the way it's done it's very fan it's fantastical yeah. like oh wow this is kind of cool but the theme at that point was i thought I, I thought the theme was she always wanted a kid never had one that's what i thought it was but then you realize oh no because he grows independent and then he leaves home and then he comes home with not only a girlfriend but a fiance yeah and announces that they're going and getting married and she won't let him leave and she pushes the woman out the front door and she tries to stop him and as he goes out the door she picks him up and eats him and then suddenly the lighting just cuts back to neutral yeah and she's in the hallway and she's horrified by what she's done yeah and then the preceding scenes reveal the the following none of it scenes. Happened, the following Not scenes. The following scenes. You need to get your yeah. tenses right, boy. The following Especially scenes. Especially if we're going to be talking about Doctor Who later in the, the year. Following, no, that'll help, surely. The following scenes reveal that she had a kid. She and her husband had had a young boy who grew up and they drifted apart. And we may have seen it from her POV. Maybe she felt he was being inappropriate. That's what, maybe, yeah, but, that's what I felt. I felt like we were seeing... How she the, felt the breakdown about of their relationship it. from her point of view yeah. through the dumpling child, yeah, the dumpling child. But it's entirely possible because of the regret that she feels that maybe she was the one in the wrong and she yeah. drove him away. Yeah. And in that one scene of just her on the bed crying, when you realise it was it all wasn't real, you're like, oh god, because the son comes back to visit, she refuses to talk to him, which is fine because it's a wordless shot. Um, he sits on the bed. And has brought the present of the donuts that they used to share, like yeah. on all of their commutes. The little bond. And they start to bond. And then we have this lovely brief montage of them spending more time together. And he brings his partner, and there yeah. she is. It's the girl from the, the original thing. Yeah. And by the end of it, everyone's getting along and it's a it's a it's a bridge mended between them. And you just go, Oh god, this was so deep for a short about a woman and a sentient <laughs> dumpling. This is so it's, cute. It's that, it's that moment where you see the silhouette. 
on the wall as she's turned around and yeah. it looks like the dumpling kid and then it cuts back and it's her actual son. Yeah. Her, 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 her got, dumpling kid looked so much like. He's just got like the that, massive that, head and the little, little yeah, sort of quiff at the top. The little the sort of hair patch. and the yeah and you just go Oh okay. And also the I love the dad, he doesn't see he doesn't pop up he doesn't he's not in it much, but when he yeah. is like there's someone where he just like he pushes him in the room, shuts the door behind him. Yeah. He's got that stern face which then can instantly switch to being very soft, warm, and yeah, yeah. it's it's a it's a masterpiece of character design. The whole thing, the fact that it, um, the three shots I think we see where they're at the dining room table and he's at the far thing, whatever's going on, he's mostly just watching the TV. Yeah, he's got one, he's got he's, he's got one el- elbow <laughs> on the on the table, but facing the TV. It's great. It's so it's so spot on. It's so human, yeah. but so style. It's almost as good as the main feature yeah that's how good it is the Pixar shorts have become they're always absolutely brilliant they're wonderful. always fucking brilliant I'm trying to remember which film because now Disney started doing it with a lot of their releases too like a lot of the Walt Disney Pictures releases now have a short attached to oh I can't say as I've noticed I'm those. trying to remember which one's my favourite what was the one before Coco Frozen Fe- uh, Frozen Fever I think it was in no, the um, States uh, Olaf's summer thing yeah I, I think that was in the I didn't, states I, I, when, when we went to see Coco I missed the first five minutes so if there was a shot yeah, we, we I didn't do, see it I think we got a shot before Coco so it might have been before the last Disney release but one of my favourite ones in recent years was the one about the guy and his happiness and it was depicted by his brain and his insides and stuff <laughs> you seen that one yeah it's freaking it's gorgeous where they're just sort of like his brain and his heart and his tummy and they're all like making different calls and eventually the brain just gives in he's like oh for god's sake and lets the heart take the reins and the guy just does what he wants to do to feel happy for a day and it's yeah. really really cool the shorts are wonderful and oh god I like, like shorts they're comfy and easy to wear Nick Picks made a video uh, this past week um, where they, they they said like uh, Pixar is dead was the title yeah and the idea be- well the idea being well Nick Nick Nitpick, Picks are, are an essay channel that are mostly more analytical and humorous and a bit twisted um I disagree with I disagree Twisted. I disagree with a lot of of their message in this particular video. But their belief is that the the the, the title's hyperbolic. Uh, their belief is no that shit. Pi- Pixar's original philosophy has been quashed, which was we only want to make original stuff. They quashed only made they only made swashed. both. They only made Toy Story two because Disney Toon were already doing it. They got wind of the stuff in it. Uh, Laster wasn't happy and went, oh, give it here. And Pixar took it and in nine months changed it completely. In nine mm. months changed it completely and put it out. And we got that freaking masterpiece that was Toy Story 2. So they said like, right, no more sequels. Leave us alone. It's just original stuff. We have like these seven ones that we've already planned that we want to do. Leave us to do it. And then they do it. And then eventually Disney buy them because Pixar were optioned into other studios. Yeah. And Disney went, look, we'll buy you because we want to keep working with you guys. We won't intrude. We only asked for one change. And they were like, what? They said, we'd like a Toy Story 3. And Pixar went, Ugh. well, we do have a story idea for that. And then, <laughs> and then they did it. Fine. But it, it, it's also my big box of story ideas that have a Toy Story <laughs> sequel. But, but as Nitpicks pointed out, out of Pixar's last 10 releases, Incredibles 2 included, half only half four half. of them have been original films. Oh, wow, more than half. Yeah, uh, Brave the Good Dinosaur, Coco and Inside Out I've not seen The Good Dinosaur I, I, I hear it wasn't particularly well received yeah Lucy saw it and said it was eh I loved Inside <laughs> Out Brave I thought was pretty good but it's definitely on the lower end of Pixar for me yeah and Incredibles 2 I, th- I think I think out of those out of those four pre-Incredibles 2 out of those four Coco's probably the best of the bunch yeah but, uh, but it's, it's, it's close like... with Inside Out though like yeah. it's, oh, it's I lo- a close I love Inside fucking Out. race I love Inside Out, but there's something about Coco that's really yeah. like I think it's just the flavor of it all. The and music, the, the, the mu- yeah, the way the music is, yeah. the way the music is obviously a big part of the story in the film, but informs how the story is told and the yeah. style and the pacing as well. Um, oh god, and the soundtrack's great because it's split into two, it's split into two discs, and one of them is everything in Spanish. That's 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 awesome, which is incredible. Yeah. Um, so it's it's great and and definitely worth uh, you know seeing if you haven't already. But um, their their thing their thing was. Pixar need to be allowed to breathe to make their original stuff again because this is how we're going to have the tales that last. Yeah. Which is a very good point. However, I would say this. If the sequel is of the quality of The Incredibles 2, I'm fine if they're going to dip into the part two well from time to time. Yeah. But it took them... Incredibles 2 was you know, great. There was a 14-year gap between Incredibles and Incredibles 2. 
And it's because Brad Bird didn't want to do a sequel because yeah. he was like, we don't do sequels at Pixar. You don't. These guys don't do that and do... I agree with them. Yeah. And and I think not, not not doing sequels ever, I don't think is necessarily a, you know, there's no reason not to do sequels. In, yeah. in, if there is a good in, in story itself, to tell. Yeah. yeah. You, you, yeah, but you've got to have a story to tell. You can't yeah. do a sequel for the sake of it. No. You've got to have that story to tell or already be telling a larger story when you start off, in mm. which case sequels are inevitable because you're telling a part of it. You're telling a larger story, like the MCU has been for the last 10 years. Um, well, they, I don't think they started out to do that, but they started out with... They started out with the, the notion the, of doing the, the notion that they could do that. Yeah. And therefore, very early on, we're able to go, okay, well, this is the story we're telling. Yeah, and no doubt that's changed along the way, but they've always managed to stick to the general outline, um, which has helped everything be so consistent. But yeah, if you're just making sequels for the sake of it, uh, or movies in a franchise for the sake of it, like I don't know, Star Wars, <laughs> maybe you're gonna get into some trouble there because you know I enjoyed Solo, but it wasn't very well received. It and was it wasn't a very, thing, and people not you know it didn't do very well at the box office. <laughs> it was. A thing. It was fine. Like it was, I'd go so far as to say it was pretty good. But it, you know, it wasn't a movie that people were crying out for, and I think that's reflected in both the critical response and the audience response. Yeah. Um. So I think Pixar are right to be fussy about se- about not doing sequels. Not necessarily not not do them at all, but certainly be more selective about the sequels they do. Like I don't think Finding Dory was particularly necessary. No. Um. And Monsters University was fine. Like it was good, but not. Like Monsters Inc. did not need a sequel or a prequel. Like you don't yeah. need to, but the, the Disney dis, the Disney machine demands sacrifice, demands blood, just like the class flesh supercomputer. Yeah, it needs blood. <laughs> it needs feed. Um, it needs feed. It needs feed. I need feed. So I yeah, need um, feed. Oh my god. Disney. I need food. Blood for the mouse god. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on the subject of tributes to vile, evil, and ancient gods, these are your emails to us. Hey! Uh, this one is from George. He says, Wow, podcasts are fun. Greetings, big damn boys. After a few problems, we're finally up and running. Yeah, and so far George's it's previously mentioned podcast. racking but fun. I can see why you're over two years in. Um, <laughs> I want to thank you both for inspiration. Hope you can give us a listen soon. We're uploading every Sunday because it's the Nerd Bible. It should be out on the holy day. I like it. I like what you did there, George. Oh, great. Um, Is it called the Nerd Bible? Uh, yes, apparently so. He sent hey! us a link to the first episode but uh, on YouTube, but I've not we've not had time to listen to it yet um, because yeah she's been busy fucking week <laughs> uh, I'll leave the episode one link but we do still have a lot to smooth out and a lot of hard work still to do you're not the only ones and we'd love to wax sweet and lyrical with your fine fellows sometime we'll give it a listen thank you George um, now send us, shamelessly... send, us, send us a catered tweet George send a tweet to us directly or link us to a tweet of yours plug in it because what we can do is put that out through our retweet um, and signal boost yes we can um, retweet and signal boost in, in your own words through our platform now I'll stop shamelessly plugging. We have a platform. Now I'll stop <laughs> shamelessly plugging myself and ask you boys some questions. What did you make of the Doctor Who teaser? Did you expect more? I think we covered that earlier. I didn't necessarily. I, I did expect a little bit more, but I wasn't disappointed. I, th- um, I thought it was fine. Um, I like the tone, and let's be honest, we're probably going to have more Doctor Who visual stuff to mull over by the time this episode has gone out. Yes, because I have a feeling. They released that teaser when they did to remind everyone it's coming and that San Diego will have the and here's what it looks like trailer. So, yes. yeah. Uh, Summit for the World Cup and then Summit for Comic-Con. What would you like to see most come out of Comic-Con? Uh, more Doctor Who footage, please. <clears throat> yeah. Um, more and... Doctor Who. Because that's all that's really at Comic-Con we're uh, talking about this year, I think. A Shazam trailer. I'd like a Shazam trailer. Aquaman trailer's dropping on Sunday, I think. Yeah. Oh, that'll definitely happen. But I'd like, um, I'd like a Shazam one. Yeah, Shazam trailer would be point. good. <laughs> Shazam and Aquaman trailers, more Doctor Who footage. Maybe a Wonder Woman uh, 1984 teaser? Uh, might be a bit early in the day for that, but I'll go for it. I'll well, they're, they're, it. they're, they're, they're uh, over a third of the way into the principal Doctor Who. Speaking of fucking trailers, did you see the um, Stranger Things season three trailer? Oh, the, uh, the, 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 the promo the for the mall. Yeah. So good. Mostly because I saw it the best way. Completely forgot I, about I it. saw it retweeted without seeing what the account without was. Without context, yeah. So I was like, what the hell is this? I saw it was Netflix. So I hit play, and I'm like a minute and a half in, like, what the hell am I watching? And there's Steve. 
I was like, oh! Steve at, um, what's it, Ahoy? Ahoy, Ahoy, Ahoy! Like, it's just really, it's an ice cream thing. It's like pirate themed or yeah, whatever. Or like, yeah, ship pirate themed. But it just narrowly popped up. I was like, wait, what? And then that's when I realised, oh god, I've just, oh, oh, that's the town it's set. Okay, this is a Stranger Things season three teaser. This so is great. great. If it's so going to be, great. if the majority of the action is going to be centred around or set in a mall. That is so 80s monster movie. I am there for it. That would be great. Chopping ball. Um, <laughs> I said good 80s horror And what movie. are your favourite ever trailers? That's all for now. I hope to hear from you soon. Thanks as always, lads. Have a wonderful week. Goodbye, my dears. George. That's a really good question. Thanks, George. Uh, what are my favourite ever trailers? Um, the thriller Stranger Things season two trailer. That was is pretty good. great. The way that's mixed is really good. Um, cool. Um, the original Spider-Man teaser because I saw it in yes. I saw it in cinemas before something. The only way you'll ever see it now, guys, if you YouTube it, um, it's the it's the helicopter in between the the World Trade Center towers. It's it's such a good teaser because it's just it's like these guys they do a bank robbery because it's especially shot like teaser and then do a bank robbery they get away scot free they're in a helicopter they avoid the police helicopters they're absolutely chuffed they're bragging about how amazing this is and suddenly the helicopter sticks and stops moving. And they're terrified that they don't know what the hell's going on, and the camera just pulls out. Yeah. And they're between the yeah. uh, World Trade t- uh, Towers, and they're trapped in a web. Yes. <laughs> and it's like, oh my god, it's a Spider Man movie! We're here! It was yes. such a great feeling. Um, that, um, that's a great teaser. The original. Original. The 2012 Avengers trailer. That, that, is, that has the money shot of the, the the camera move around the team. Seeing that for the first time was nuts. Fuck a duck. That was so funny. That cool. blew my mind. Um, all the trailers for the Lord of the Rings films. All of them. Yeah. All had great trailers. I'm not a fan of the show, but two years ago when American Horror Story did those teasers that were all just different styles because they were trying to leave people guessing as to what the hell the series was oh, actually going to be about. They them. did loads. There's like one where it's just sort of someone's mouth opening like slowly and the spider just crawled yeah. out. There was one of this like porcelain doll. The camera just zoomed in a dark room. The camera just zooms towards it and its sort of smile starts to crack, but then it's the the, the porcelain around the mouth like cracks open and reveals like a tooth yeah. more. It was just like, these are really cool. Like a Nosferatu-esque silhouette in a hotel and stuff. And none of them had anything to do with the series that year. They were just trying to get people like guessing, oh, what's the theme going to be? Yeah. And it was like, these are really cool teaser trailers. The um, the Fireball trailer for season one of Doctor Who. Oh, God, yeah. Do you want to come with me? Yeah, that's great. Because if you do, it's I'm really going to you. It's really, really oh, good. God, it's, it's so amazing. very, very good. Uh, oh, Christ. What else? What else? What else? I'm trying to think of all the teasers and teasers specifically have grabbed me by the testes in years gone by. Yes. Um, the Jurassic Park teaser originally was just like the logo and stuff, wasn't it? With a bit of voiceover. Like the original I, teaser. I've, it's been so long. So long since it's I've been seen so it. It's been so long, man. Oh, the, uh, the first Matrix trailer. Oh, what was that one? Uh, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. That is some good fucking yeah. marketing right there. Yeah. The Godzilla '97 teasers were actually really yes. good, especially the, the movie posters. Was dog shit. Movie was dog shit. That's a lot of fish. Um, the worm guy. Oh, God, it's the Topolis. <laughs> Such a terrible movie. Fucking awful. Um, but I'm not gonna. But I'm the, not the gonna say I don't Martin. enjoy it. Yeah, well, I enjoy it, it too. Fucking terrible. I enjoy though. it. It is garbage. Yeah, it's really bad. Elvis movies. He was the king. He was the king. Um, Jesus. But the, the marketing, like the whole, his foot is as long as this bus. That was, they just said things like that. His and then, foot and is the as release, long as this bus. And, like, like, and then the release date. And yeah. like billboards on buildings that says he's yeah. as tall as this building. Yeah. And then the release date. It's like, what is it? What the fuck is it? Mm-hmm. It's Godzilla. Mm-hmm. like, oh shit. Because mm-hmm. um, the teaser was just that original shot of like the, the fisherman and the, the wave, the wave slowly rising yeah. and those fins just coming out. It was like, what is this? Yeah. The Cloverfield teaser. That was of a similar ilk. Yes. Yeah, that was uh, good. The 2012 Godzilla. Was it not 2014 Godzilla yeah. uh, trailer with the Halo jump. Yeah. That was Frick. great. Yeah, And also the great. best sequence in the movie, hands down. Like, that was awesome. They're, they're shooting the sequel of that at the moment, aren't they? Yeah, King of the Monsters. Well, yeah. King of um, the Monsters. Yeah. Is that just right? Just been casting that, or am I thinking of something else? Someone just been has just been casting. I remember seeing Captain Who's. No, it's, no, it's, a, Bla- it's no a Black idea. Panther alumni. Uh, did I? 
no idea. Guerrero, I think she wasn't paying attention. It. I know um, there was a casting news for it, but I can't remember who it was. Well, right, it cast Letitia Wright in it as well. Yeah, why not? Why Just not? like up the class. Up um, the class of the movie would be like, hey, do you remember that cast from that really fucking cool film from last year? Well, they're all in this. Chadwick Boseman's going to punch Mothra. <laughs> I'd be like, yeah, I'm watching that. <laughs> I'd watch the shit out of that. Um, Jacob! Jacob! Says hello! Jacob! Responsible for at least 28 murders. 29, but they haven't found that one yet. Uh, that's all allegations. Yeah, it's not true. Completely it's not true. unfounded allegations. No, Billy. Hello. <laughs> Big damn cockers. Oh, bless you, for you are the chosen. So that Doctor Who trailer was good, or at least I thought it was. Over the past few days, I've seen quite a few people on Twitter complaining that it was a letdown, but at least it was something. I'm just glad we got something, finally. I'm with you on that, Jacob. I don't... The series is coming before the end of the year. What do you want? Do you want the whole first episode? Is that what people want? Because you're not going to get it. Just... It'll, it'll be out when it's out. It's coming home. You know what I'd seen of the of the of the two thousand five series before, um, before I saw the first episode, the Fireball trailer. That's all I'd seen, which differs from this only in that that had a bit of dialogue in it. This had dialogue in it. Nope. Oh, there's a squirrel. Oh, there's another pizza. Oh, there's another pizza. Why has the pizza got dressing? The beano. Why is the yeah? Oh, the beano. It's a Japanese pizza. Put mayonnaise on them. Um, they put mayonnaise in them. Yeah. Mm, surprise! So been, they call it pizza surprise. So I've been watching Doctor Who on Twitch, and I'm really enjoying it. Hey! I got to watch The Awakening and Frontios, two episodes I had never seen before. The first of which I quite liked. The second, there were some very good ideas, but I fell asleep halfway through it. That's like 90% of 80s Who. Yes! Um, Doctor, yes. Who quest- Doctor Who you. questions. Which era of Doctor Who would you trade for all the missing episodes? If you could pick an unmade story and have it made, which one would it be? Personally, I'd like to see the story Stephen Fry wrote, or The Dark Dimension. Have a big damn week, Jacob. P.S. Last week's guest was fantastic. No, last week's guest was John Granston. (laughs) Pronounce it right. (laughs) Yes, he was fantastic. Um, And we'll have him back any time. What's the Capaldi era? You can trade one era. I trade the Capaldi era for all the missing episodes. I trade the Capaldi era for every missing sixties story. That's I, I, I don't I don't even want the what ifs. I just want what we definitely had and existed in some form back in exchange for three years of stuff that I didn't enjoy very much. I'm very very sorry. Oh, but. Oh. If it came down to it, oh. on a sheer numbers game, the sheer prag- pragmatist in me yeah. would say, you have the TV movie, have Paul McGann, and give me Fury from the Deep, and everything else. You trade in the TV movie? For all the missing episodes? You fucking kidding me? The TV movie? Are you fucking kidding me? But his shoes. They fit perfectly. Yeah. But so would all the episodes in the gaps in the series. Will Sasso's in it. Them. Will Sasso's in the TV movie. Yes, he's not spitting out lemons. Eric but he's Roberts in it. is in the TV movie. You know, I get it. I know, get it. Don't you know, worry. You know he's coming back, right? Sorry, what? Did you not know? What? He has either recorded or is about to record a new master story for Big Finish. Oh, yes! I, I remember... It's happened. I recall seeing this in passing and going... <clears throat> and then thinking, oh, Tim Allen, what a dick. And never doing it again. And that, and that just kind of took every... On the subject of this, this is a bit of a tangent. Yeah. Um, oh, well, that's, se- that's something we've never done before. Kanisha sent me a video the other day of a, a, a mod for the original Doom. Yeah. Wherein every sprite oh, and no. texture no. has been replaced no. with a signed photograph of Tim Allen, Why? Home Improvement era Tim Allen, Why? and every sound effect has been replaced with. Uh? Why? I'll show you the video later. No, don't. It's don't ever show it. The to me. worst thing. Please never. Um, Please never show it to me. Yeah. TV movie. All the missing who? It's a no-brainer. Just from a purely practical point of view, it's a numbers game. You get rid of 90 minutes of, of, of fairly mediocre TV with a great lead, mm. and you get back dozens and dozens of hours of vintage TV. 
good or not, some of those stories are no doubt very bad. <laughs> but there's more of them. If we're talking numbers, that's what we're going to do. Wait. Um, no, but hang on. You'd sacrifice three seasons of Capaldi who? No, you'd rather, you'd rather sacrifice the TV movie over the three seasons of Capaldi who? I think if you sift Because that it, loses Paul McGann. If you sift through it, yeah. like a, um, a prospector, <laughs> there's more good material buried in the three seasons of Peter Capaldi than there is in the whole other TV movie. I disagree. Okay. I disagree. That's fine. I've... I'm going to start a petition to remake the TV movie. Because <sighs> you disagree with me. Look what we've done, guys. <laughs> Look what we've done. We, the Doctor Who fans, do on this day declare our rebellion against the 1996 TV no, movie. No! No! <laughs> No, no, purely, purely from a numbers game. Purely from a. Uh, this is not a game I like to play. TV. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, if you could pick what an unmade story and have it made, which one would it be? An oh. Unmade story. I know so little about unproduced stories. That season of Six Dogs that never got made. Yeah, Nightmare Fair, Mission to Magnus, yeah. Ultimate Evil. Oh. Yeah, Ultimate Evil. Mm. Ultimate Evil was the missing one that didn't Ultimate get produced. Foe was Ultimate the... Foe is Trial of the Time Lord. Time Let me look Lord, yeah. up um, unproduced Doctor Who stories and let's have a quick gander in these before we go. Um, because well, for, I think for me, be that, interesting for me thing, that'd so. be the one because I'd be curious to see more Six Doctor and mm-hmm. Perry in um, what sounded like some pretty sort of nightmarish and interestingly creepy stories. Um... No pity! <laughs> okay, I, don't think so... the, I don't think the Doctor Dimension was ever actually done I think it was an idea and it was like it was like a oh yeah it, it was like I a four was... or five page document but it was never a a done deal or a yeah we're definitely making this kind so, of so this is this is on Wikipedia these are like so you add um nothing at the end of the lane slash the giants some of which was became planet of the giants um with uh, the leads being shrunk down to miniature size and attacked by giant animals um. Yeah, that sounds terrible. Um, <laughs> the Masters of Luxor, which has been the script has been released. Mm-hmm. I think I've got the script at home actually. Um, what? Because they did it. Titan Titan Books released a series of the scripts. Ah, uh, right. so I've got I've got the Daleks. I've got two more. I think one of them is uh, Masters of Luxor. Um. Uh, six part story submitted by Anthony Coburn for series one the doctor faced a self aware robot trying to gain a soul uh, it was rejected in favour of Termination's first Dalek serial uh, it doesn't really say much about that so I don't know Britain 408 AD Hidden Planet by Malcolm Polk the Red Fort Fell Great Macedon so that would have been an historical these are all these would all make ones. really good metal album titles yeah the fragile yellow arc of fragrance Okay, I said good album titles. One episode long and a calling card piece never seriously pitched for production. Uh, was adapted by Nigel Robinson for Big Finishes, The Lost Stories. These were all adapted for the Big Finish Lost Stories range. The Living World uh, by Alan Wakeman, uh, a planet ruled by sentient rocks and trees, the ability to control inhumans with an inaudible sound. Um, and uh, the concept of living plants had already been used in Keys of Marinus. Uh, the Dark Planet by you know, Face of God, Hands of Eight, and New Man. There's not much information about the really, really early ones. It tends to be when you get into uh, the Tom Baker era where there's more stuff. So you've got things like. Um, where are you? Uh, the original version of Ark in Space, Puffball. Um, John Luke Rotti script uh, six part story the Delk crustball like fungus with separate heads and bodies the final episode has the Doctor defeating the Delk leader by hitting it out into space with the golf club um, <laughs> Luke Rotti plans to give each episode a frivolous title citing Puffball as the title of an early episode and Golf Ball as the title of the final episode <laughs> when the draft scripts arrived from his home in Corsica uh, Robert Holmes and Philip Hinchcliffe felt they were far too ambitious and complicated to realise on the programme's budget and Luca Rotti had over conceptualised the story um, and was replaced with the Robert Holmes version of The Ark in Space um, 
Douglas Adams had an idea for a story involving a ship leaving Earth and filled with affluent but useless members of society, which of course later became the B-Arc story in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which yeah. is fucking great. Um, we got there's of course the stuff like uh, the um, the Scratch Man. That's who meets Scratch Man. And yeah, and which was like which that. was a movie that Baker was uh, trying to get made where Doctor. Uh, what's it? Doctor Who um, met the devil basically and had to fight the devil. The Cricket Man, the Cricket Men, which again became, which again Douglas Adams reused. Uh, it's what he originally pitched, which then was, um, uh, it it was rejected by Robert Holmes, but led to him being commissioned for the Pirate Planet. Yeah, and it's uh, he tried to pitch it to Paramount Pictures, a potential Doctor Who film. But he and then included the ideas from the Cricket Men in Life, the Universe, and Everything, which mm. is the second Hitchhiker's Guide to the, the Galaxy. Uh, the inhabitants of the planet Cricket uh, built a race of androids called the Cricket Men to wipe out all life in the universe. The Time Lords trapped them in a temporal prison. A group of Cricket Men escaped the Time Lord sentence, and they're trying to reassemble the components of a key, uh, which resembled the Wicket from yeah. the game of Cricket. And uh, it's actually a reflection of the old war. The game of cricket is a reflection of the old war. Yeah. The Doctor and Sarah stumble upon the plot when they see the cricket men steal the ashes during a test match at Lords, and then they travel to the planet Beth Salamin to file the next of the cricket men's quest. The whole temporal prison, the key looks like a wicket thing, is reused, and them stealing the mm. ashes from Lords is reused in Life, the Universe, and everything. Yeah, and it's great. It's what he's saying is great. The Doctor Who team fucked up several times by um, not letting these things be a thing. I would have loved to have seen a completed version of Shada. I could not care less. Because <laughs> I'm so bored of it. I just have yeah, well it's Hello. the only, it's the only thing for them to the, Look at me could, punting <laughs> Song of the Space Whale. Originally pitched by Pat Mills and John Wagner in nineteen eighty as a four as a fourth Doctor story, and was originally supposed to be the in the introduction of Turlo. Oh. And it was a people living in the belly of a whale in space. Uh, the Doctor would find it while he was trying to protect it from being slaughtered by a factory ship. The castaways living in the whale are all the working class. Um, and it's sort of Northern Irish allegory for Northern Irish immigrants. Um, yeah, but it didn't get made. The space whale concept um, obviously was reused for the Beast Below. Yeah, you know, that happened. Um, Genesis of the Cybermen. The Kit Peddler, the uh, the Gary Davis story, mm. um, which again that would have been later explored by spare parts when Mark Platt But again, that wasn't an adaptation of Genesis Cybermen. Yeah. It was, I believe, there's a version of that, and you know the big Cybermen coffee table book by David Banks. Yeah, I think there's a sort of outline of that in that. Which in that I, book. I've, I've got it. I've got it home, so I'll have to check it you out. You got it, Robert. Home, no, Z- no, David Banks. Oh yes, uh, you left s- it at the David Bank. Bank, z- 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 uh, but yeah, like there's not there's not a great deal of information on a lot of the um, unproduced stories. A lot of the unproduced stuff for um, Sylvester McCoy was later incorporated into the New Adventure stuff, like most notably Lung Barrow, mm. uh, which was the last New Advent, the last Seventh Doctor New Adventure. Um, there's of course the the original plan season twenty three, which were all completed. So you got the Nightmare Fair, Ultimate Evil, Mission to Madness, Yellow Fever, and How to Cure It, which was republished as a missing adventure. Um, yeah, Iceberg, which was Cybermen in a New Ice Age, which was written by David Banks. Mm. That became a new adventure. Um, <laughs> He yeah. really, really wanted to do more stuff, didn't all he? All that stuff. All that stuff. I could, um, I could be the cyber leader so yeah. again. I'll I'll put on a girdle this I, time. I would like to have seen... Oh, this is interesting. Oh? I'll just I'll dig into this quickly before we go. Now, these. These I would have liked to see. This is the 1990s US reboot, Leakly Bible. Yeah, this was this was pitched alongside the TV movie's production, wasn't it? From From Wikipedia. Early in the process that was to lead to the 1996 Doctor Who film, Universal Television had Amblin Entertainment produce a writer's bible which detailed John Leakley's proposed pilot and episodes of a new series. 
The new series would have established a new continuity rather than following on from the classic series, and the Bible reused many elements from the classic series. It's unclear whether clearance could have been obtained for all the episodes detailed, as the costs would likely have fallen to the BBC. The pilot was to feature the half-human doctor seeking his father Ulysses through various time periods. Contemporary Gallifrey, where Barusa dies and is merged with the TARDIS and the Master becomes the leader of the Time Lords, England during the Blitz, Ancient Egypt, and Skaro, where the Daleks are being created. Other proposed episodes in the Bible included The Pirates, in which the Doctor teamed up with Blackbeard, and several remakes of stories from the classic series, including The Talons of Wang Chiang, set in New York City, Earthshock, featuring the Cybes, Leakley's more political version of the Cybermen, Horror of Fang Rock, The Celestial Toymaker, who was to have been revealed to be under the control of the Master, Don't Shoot, I'm the Doctor, a more historically accurate remake of the Gunfighters, Tomb of the Cybes, a remake of the Tomb of the Cybermen, I in which the Cybes so are awoken by the Master, The Yeti, a remake of the Abominable Snowmen, featuring the Dalai Lama and Sir Edmund Hillary, and The Ark in Space. Earlier versions of the Bible included, among others, The Cybes, a story set on Mars in which the Doctor escapes capture by hiding in a gold mine, a remake of The Sea Devils set on a Louisiana oil rig, The Outcasts, in which the Cybes would attack Gallifreyan outcasts, the Land of Fear, a conflation of the Reign of Terror and the Claws of Axos. Now, that is two stories that do not belong together. No. Um, a remake of the Daemons. Two set great in, tastes that don't taste great together. A remake of the Daemons set in Salem, Massachusetts. That's inspired. Yeah, That's I mean, the, cool. the Sea Devils set in freaking New Orleans is pretty inspired um, as well, to be fair. A completed version of Shada, which would have introduced Romana and Professor Cronotis as Romana's uncle. Now, this is the kicker. Oh, Leakley's scripts were not well received at Amblin or elsewhere, <laughs> and in September 1994 he was removed from the project. But I think that's interesting in that someone took a bunch of elements from the classic series and went, mm-hmm. alright, well, let's just start from scratch and retool them all into something new and united. Yeah. And take elements of those stories and make it a more coherent continuity rather than it have been been bought. Let's take what worked about the classic series. Yeah put it all into a big melting pot and make it more consistent i think there's legs i i i am shocked genuinely shocked that nicholas briggs hasn't had that big finish yet yeah there's genuinely there's some some really cool stuff in that there's some terrible stuff like the word the sibes c-y-b-s sibes but that is what i'd like to see just as an experiment to see what it was like Okay, I wonder how much of it was written, written then. It wouldn't have been all um, of those stories. They no, have been, like, that, was, was what, that was what was planned in the series Bible. Yeah. Um, but it was his scripts not being well received. Um, yeah. So he could have written some absolute gash, basically. <laughs> but at the same time, the Sibes, oh God, oh God. No, but yeah, if we could peer into a what-if universe, that'd be interesting. Presuming that the Doctor would still be played by Paul McGann, if like the fates had twisted in that way, and he oh, been... oh the cartoon, the Lovana cartoon, what from about six years ago? The Canada one from nineteen ninety. Oh no, not from six years ago. Oh god, the one where he looks like Egon. Yes. yes. You and John were talking about this last yes. week. Yes. <laughs> Concept art was produ- prepared depicting several possible versions of the Doctor modelled on actors such as Peter O'Toole, Jeff Goldblum, and Christopher Lloyd. Yes. Yes. Uh, ha, uh, uh, ha. It, uh, homo uh, sapiens. Uh, ha, ha. The series... Uh, the series would have been Nirvana's biggest show to date. However, according to Bastion, Ted Bastion, the, the head of the studio, mm. it was pulled out from under us after a British animation studio told the BBC that it could do what Nirvana intended for a much lower price. Oh. And the project did not proceed further and no pilot was produced. Nor was anything produced from that British company, by nope. the way. No, bloody hell. Nope. Uh, we were scripting and storyboarding on it and about four scripts had been written. Bloody hell. So they were getting there. They were getting there. <laughs> there was there was the designs that did the rounds from like 2010 2011 as well yes for, for a series that I don't know if it was ever like in a state of pre-production or if it just went beyond one artist's pitch but it was the idea was the companions of the main characters and it was two young kids and each series would be the next um subsequent incarnation of the Doctor yeah so the first series would have been with the first Doctor and the idea is that these are companions that the Doctor returned to um, 
several times. Do you know what I mean? So like each series would have a different tone based on the Doctor that led it. Yeah. Which is quite a cool idea. Like the idea that we have a consistent character and they're sort of uh, they're sort of inspired a bit by the the young companions from the the TV comics stuff from the sixties. Like these yeah. two little kids who he spends time with. Oh, is this a picture from the Canadian that's one? That's the Nirvana concept art. Bloody hell. Oh yeah, that's one of them, isn't it? Because that's, that's not the Egon-looking one, is it? That's no, the... no, but it's a similar character design. That's like the Christopher Lloyd E1, I'm guessing. Yeah. Like a patchwork coat. Like the coat looks dirty as sin. He's got a jaunty scarf. Is that K9? K9. On a flying platform. On a flying platform, with his name on it, so everyone knows it's his. K9. Well, it is K9, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, is that Daleks? Daleks in... in Hover things. Hoverbouts in battleships, I guess. That's weird. Yeah. I Very like strange. It. I like it. It likes you. So yeah, there's so many Doctor Who's that we could have had. There's one wrote a book about that called The Nth Doctor. Oh, there yeah. was about all these different. It was about all thingies. yeah. Oh wow. Various different unmade Doctor Who projects. That was in the nineties though. So anyway, hmm. we've talked far too much about something completely frivolous. <laughs> Let's. Oh wait, that's what we do every week. Thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed. Hope you enjoyed it. If you want to get in touch with us for various reasons and don't. bollocks, don't. But if you still feel, <laughs> if you still feel compelled, if you feel the need, big damn contact at gmail dot com. Yeah. Electronic mail. It's the past and also the future. Electronic mail. Preceding that, if you would like to tw- tweet at us at big damn cast on the Twitter. The Twitter. <laughs> also follow big damn stream on Twitch. Or regular streaming updates. And if you're thinking to yourself, still after all this time, because you didn't listen or pay attention in the beginning, why haven't they talked about San Diego Comic Con? It's because it hasn't happened for us just yet. And we'll be talking about it in next week's now annual San Diego Comic Con Roundup Pebble. The third annual San Diego Comic Con after the fact news dribble. Yes? What? I'm Christopher Big Old Neck. I'm... I'm looking at pictures of the Nelvana Doctor and wishing that that was the reality I lived in. And you've just been... Sibes. Sibes. <laughs>